a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. Pretty Lee. I didn't realize a dress parade could be so thrilling. Mm, it's a great sight, Jerry. Do you know, this is the first time I've seen a dress parade, too. What do you mean? All the time you've been here at Fair Oaks, and this is the first time you've seen a dress parade? Sure. I've always been in them before. Oh, yeah, that's right. Hey, come on, let's finish this job. We didn't come up here to review the parade. Besides, we're supposed to be finished by the time the drill's over. Well, we've only got the A to get off. Well, come on, let's get at it. Hand me that can of gasoline. Yeah, here you are. Keep plenty of gas on your rag. There's a lot left in the can. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's a good thing you didn't make a better job of this painting. It's hard enough getting these letters off as it is. <laughs> if I'd have known I had to clean it off myself, I'd have put watercolor on instead of regular paint. <laughs> oh, that band sure helps. What do you mean that, that helps? Oh, I can always work better to music. Come on, let's pitch in now and get this over with. Hey, uh, you got another rag there? This one's so full of paint, I'm just smearing it around instead of cleaning it off. <laughs> okay. Here, take this one. Oh, thanks. Look, Jerry, there goes the last formation. They'll leave the field in a couple of minutes now. Oh, we've only got a little more to do. Hey, you got the other side? Yes, I'll get that off. Hey, you know something? What? I think we're in for something with the upperclassmen. Why? What do you mean? Well, everyone has the afternoon off as soon as the parade's over. Unless I miss my guess, they'll use the time making things uncomfortable for us. No, no, you're wrong there, Jerry. They won't do a thing. Probably might be in for some kidding, but that's about all. This year's paint crew did their job, and that's that. Uh... Then you don't think they're angry about it? Oh, of course not. Oh, they might be a little peeved because they didn't catch us, but... Oh, they haven't been able to stop a plebe class from painting those letters yet. So they just take it as a matter of course. <laughs> They'd have to stay up night and day and keep watch. Hey, you know... If I didn't get the letters painted last night, I would have kept trying over and over again until I did. Mm, that's the old fight. That's the spirit that gets the stack painted every year. You can't keep a good plebe down. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> well, I guess we've just about got the job done. Oh, get that little spot there to your left. You hear? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's not paint. That's a little nick in the cement. Oh. Well, then I guess we're through. Careful going down now. There they go off the field. Parade's over. Mm-hmm. Come on, let's get down. Boy, am I hot and tired, too. Yeah, that sun is pretty warm. Hey, I got an idea. Yeah? What? What do you say we go right over to Max and get some ice cream? Check. Oh, but wait. Uh, we'll have to go up to the room first. I haven't got any money with me. Oh, I got some. I'll lend you what you need. Come on, now. Let's get this ladder down. Now, get a hold of the other side there. Yeah, I've got it. All right. Take it slowly now. It's pretty heavy. Oh, yeah, I know. Last night it didn't seem this heavy when we put it up. <laughs> That's because we were excited. <laughs> you got a lot of extra strength at a time like that. Ah, I guess you're right. Okay. Let it down easy. All right. There. 
Well, that's that. <laughs> Stack looks pretty clean from here. Think it'll pass? <laughs> it's as clean as we could get it. And besides, I think it looks a lot cleaner than it did before we painted it. <laughs> yeah, on this side. Uh, anyway. <laughs> well, come on, let's get going. Hey, you go first. I'll hand the gas can down to you. Okay. Here's the can now. And here I come. Hey, get your fingers out of the way. Not so fast. Be careful. Hey, look who's coming. It's Red Morrison, and, and who's that with, uh, uh, Cully Newsom? I wonder what they're coming out here for. Oh, to inspect our job, I suppose. Well, what's it their business? Well, don't say anything, Jerry. If they want to kid us, just let them. Oh, I won't say anything. There's this year's paint crew, Cully. Nice salute, Dugan. You're getting better. Where's that salute, Cadet Phillips? You don't get one. What's that? You'd better salute me if you know what's good for you. Make it snappy. <laughs> That's insubordination to a cadet officer, Phillips. You'd uh, better look up the rules on salutes, Morrison. You see, Dugan and I are on work detail and in work clothes. No salute is necessary. Sorry? Then then I didn't have to salute either? Of course not. <laughs> I'm afraid the joke's on you this time, Red. The boys have you there, Red. <laughs> you keep out of this, Tully. <laughs> I think I'll laugh, too. <laughs> I wouldn't laugh too much if I were you, Dugan. <laughs> yeah, but you're not me. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose because you painted the stack, you think you're out of the plebe class. Well, you're not. You've got a long ways to go. Oh, speaking of going, come on, Jerry. It isn't good to be seen in bad company. <laughs> I'm going to remember that crack, Phillips. And all the upperclassmen aren't going to forget that you're part of the paint crew. There are a few things you can get away with around here, but you've just about used up your quota. Oh, now, don't scare me like that, Red. I won't be able to sleep tonight. I, uh... Oh, oh what's the use? <laughs> <laughs> if you'll excuse us now. <laughs> come on, Jerry. Yeah. Goodbye, Captain Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't think we should have gone that far. What are you talking about? I mean with Red. Oh. Well, what do you think he'll do about it? Oh, maybe nothing at all. He might even forget it. All cadet officers and upperclassmen remember when they were plebes and how important it was to be the paint crew of their class. Deep down in his heart, Red thinks we're okay for being able to paint the stack. I'll bet he does it then. Sure he does. Hey, come on, let's cut across past the parade ground. No, okay. Oh, say, I meant to ask you, mm -hmm. what did Captain Bogart have to say to you when you went into his office? I mean, besides telling you to help me. Oh, nothing. He said he knew who the other boys were, but he figured it was you and me who planned the whole thing. Then I guess Tubby and Harold get out of it. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, hey, are we going to get demerits? Well, I don't know. He said he'd decide our punishment after he saw what kind of a job we did cleaning off the stack. Oh, and if we did a good job, we won't get so many demerits, huh? Mm, I guess that's it. Well, I don't think it'd be more than ten anyway, and it was worth that. I got a kick out of it. I'm even going to write and tell Mr. Randall. Yeah. Oh, look, there goes a couple of the upperclassmen through the arch. I guess they're going over to Max. Then do you think it's safe for us to go? Well, certainly. They're not going to do anything. But Red said something about the upperclassmen not forgetting that we painted the sack. Oh, he was bluffing. You afraid to go in? No, of course not. Hey, we left that gasoline can sitting back there at the powerhouse. Well, that's right, we did. Oh, well, never mind now. We'll get it later and take it back to Kirk. Yeah, okay. Hey, how about these dirty rags? What do we do with them? Oh, we can give them to Mac. He'll throw them away for us. <laughs> you think of everything, don't you? <laughs> you ask the questions and I'll answer them. Ah, that's what you're doing. Hey, look out, Jerry. Boy, he just missed me. You weren't watching. <laughs> Jiminy, I'm so used to being on the quad and so seldom walk in the street that I don't look for cars anymore. <laughs> well, you'd better. Well, here comes another upperclassman. Let's get in first. Go ahead. Hello, Mac. Oh, uh, greetings, greetings, lad. Uh, you're, you're just the ones I'm looking for. Why? Well, you said you were going to let me in on a secret today. Oh, yeah, that, that's right, we did. Hi, paint crew. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. <laughs> there you are, Jerry. There's an upperclassman that gives us congratulations. <laughs> that's pretty good. Well, uh, what is it? What's the secret? Well, uh... We painted the smokestack last night. Oh, you did, huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> and you just now cleaned it all off, too, didn't you? <laughs> How'd you know? Somebody tell you? Why, hey, Phillips, I'm surprised at you. Do you think I've been around Fair Oaks all these years for nothing? I, I knew yesterday what you were up to. Yes, sir, I, I knew it right along. You, you can... Uh, I can tell what you lads are up to by the look in your ear. Oh, <laughs> yeah? Oh, yeah. Uh, excuse me. I, I'll feel this man's order. Well, what will it be? A bottle of that pop, Mac. All right. Hey, do you think he really knew it yesterday? Maybe. Then why didn't he say so instead of asking us what the secret was? Well, it might be that he didn't want to spoil our fun. <laughs> yeah, there you are. Thank you. Yes, sir. You lads will have to go some to put one over an old Mac. You'll have to go some. But uh, how did you know? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. I just had a hunch at first. Just a hunch. Then shortly after you boys were in here, 
I, I saw Tubby Young walk right past the frontier and go next door to see Mr. Peters in the hardware. He, he wasn't in there long uh, when he came out carrying his package by a handle. Mm-hmm. And you figured it was paint. Mm, well, what else was he going in there for? <laughs> <laughs> You're too smart, Mac. <laughs> <laughs> Not half as smart as you are. Uh, you figured that uh, paint and trick out very well. Congratulations, Jerry Dugan. I'd like to shake your hand. Yeah, that's a boy. <laughs> now, see here. Uh, you notice all those uh, pictures of those cadets uh, over the candy counter in back of you there? Uh-huh. Well, those are all painters. Each one of those lads was the stock painter of his class. Uh, since the first one, mind you. Well, then, painting the stack has been a plebe tradition since Fair Oaks was first founded, huh? Ah, uh-huh, that's right. Well, some clever freshman figured that out. Oh, no, no. No. <laughs> Not clever freshman, Lee. <laughs> clever Scotchman. What? You heard me, Jerry. So long, Mac. Oh, goodbye, lad. Hurry back. Uh, who was he, if he wasn't a freshman? Well, it was none other than <laughs> yours truly. You, Matt? Old McLeod himself in person. <laughs> oh, well, how could you start a tradition for the school if you weren't a student? Well, I put the first paint crew up to it. Say, that's all right. <laughs> that's key. Well, how'd you happen to think of it, Matt? Well, I, I really didn't think of it myself. I brought it over with me from Scotland. Mm. Uh, you can, when I went to the university there, our first year class used to paint the class numerals up on the water tower. Oh, and here I thought it was strictly a fair oaks tradition. <laughs> what do you know about that? <laughs> hello, Mac. Hi, hello, boys. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Welcome to the establishment. Uh, oh, say, Jerry, I, I was uh, talking about those pictures. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I want a picture of you to hang up there with the other painters and, and sign it. From Painter Dugan. <laughs> okay, Mac, I'll do that. Uh-huh, and I'll hang it up. Yes, sir. And proudly. I'm, I'm glad it was you that did the job this year. Yes, sir. Very glad. Hello, Dugan. Hello. Hi. Hello. You the painter, Dugan? Yes, sir. Well, I was the painter three years ago. Congratulations. Thanks. See, I told you the upperclassmen would be all right. Uh-huh. Hey, Mac, as mm-hmm. long as you know so much about the stack tradition, tell me, uh, how many demerits do we get? Demerits? Demerits? I... Losh, lad, you, you don't get any, any for that. Your punishment is taking the letters off. Really? Why, that's right. Wow, oh boy, oh boy, no demerit. <laughs> I think I'll do it over again. No, 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 no you won't. Uh, and you'll not be helping the next plead paint crew by giving them ideas and telling them how to go about it. Oh, I get you. Okay, <laughs> Mac. Hey, well, oh, hello, Newsom. Hello, Mac. <laughs> Hiya, Cully. Did Red get over his peeve? No. I'm glad you asked me about that. After you fellas walked away, we went over to the stable. And Sergeant Alden was there. Did you find out anything about the list for the riding team? I was just coming to that, Jerry. Yes, I did. That is, the sergeant hinted that you, as well as four or five other boys, have been selected for the test. Oh, I knew you'd be on the list, Jerry. Oh, it's not set yet. I only gathered from what the sergeant's conversation said. But listen to this. Red made the remark to me that he was going to see that you didn't get on the list, Jerry. Well, now, wait a minute. How can can he stop uh, anything that Sergeant Alden wants to do? I don't know. That's what he said, though. And he's pretty clever at figuring things out. Oh, what's he want to pick on Jerry for? I'm the one that got his goat. I don't know that either, Lee. I'm only telling you what I heard. Oh, by the way, the sergeant said that he'd have the list up on the bulletin board tomorrow afternoon. Uh, gee, I hope you make it, Jerry. I'd sure like to see you on that riding team. Well, we'll just have to wait until tomorrow to find out.
secret word tonight is heart. H-E-A-R-T. Really? You bet your life. The more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America present the best of Groucho. Yes, friends, it's a Groucho summertime. By popular demand from your letters, from rating histories, and the acclaim of critics, the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers bring you selected shows from You Bet Your Life, the comedy quiz series produced and transcribed from Hollywood. Groucho Marx is on vacation, friends, and will return in the fall. Until then, it's fun and laughs each week this summer as we proudly present some of the best of Groucho's past shows. And here he is, the one, the only... <laughs> Me. Well, here I am again with $1,500 for one of our couples. Fenneman, who's place to try for the $1,500? Well, we invited some weathermen and some cashiers who work in drive-in theaters to the program tonight. And just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected Miss Winnie Wynn and the weatherman John Aldrich. Folks, come over here and meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, kids, to You Bet Your Life. And if you say the secret word, you'll divide $100. It's a common word, something you always have with you. John Aldrich, huh? Speak for yourself, John Aldrich, wasn't it? <laughs> well, uh, Miss Wynn, you're a, a movie cashier? Is that, That's is that right. Where, where are you from? My birthplace is Bristol, Oklahoma. Winnie Wynn. Isn't that a cute name, huh? A cute girl, too, huh? Thank you. I'll just call you Winnie. Winnie the Pooh, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, how old are you, Winnie? Twenty-seven. Twenty-seven? Well, you don't look it. I thought you were about twenty-one. Thank you. They must take good care of you in Oklahoma. Right? <laughs> uh, are you married? Yes, I am. Well, you don't look at them. <laughs> <laughs> Mr., uh, what is your name? Uh, Mr. Aldrich, huh? You're, you're the weatherman, huh? Eh? Yes, sir. Well, where do you hail from? <laughs> <laughs> Des Moines, Iowa. You get that, son? I said, uh, where do you hail from? Yeah. <laughs> and you're a weatherman. Eh? Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's deucedly clever, huh? <laughs> well, what are your duties uh, in the Weather Bureau, John? <clears throat> well, our uh, duties of the Weather Bureau are threefold. to furnish forecasts for the general public and for aviation and for uh, fire protection. How is it your weatherman gets wrong so much of the time? <laughs> well, we don't do it by guessing. I, I beg your pardon. Uh, <laughs> how is it your scientific analysis, based on precise mathematical calculations, are so consistently incorrect? <laughs> Riddle me that, old boy. <laughs> well, we don't do so badly. You're not always wrong, eh? Huh? We're not always wrong. It's, you mean it's the weather that's usually wrong, eh? Huh? <laughs> what, uh, what would you say your average is? Well, from 50 to 100%. Is that so? You mean you're 100% correct 50% of the time? <laughs> now, I, I know that everybody makes jokes about the weather, man. Do, do you have any favorite jokes? <clears throat> I imagine well, you get a lot of kidding about the weather. Well, I think my favorite is the story about the uh, king who led his knights out to battle. And uh, on the way, he met a farmer, and the farmer hailed him and said, Oh, king, uh, better not go on. It's going to rain. Oh, no, no, I've checked with my prophets. So uh, <clears throat> on he went, and it rained. And uh, he was driven back, defeated. So uh, after beheading his prophets, um, why, uh, the king sent for the farmer. And he said, uh, look here, my man, uh, how was it you knew the storm was coming? Well, uh, your highness, uh, I have a little beast of burden. He's very sensitive to weather. And uh, when his ears are erect, why, you know the good weather's ahead. But when his ears droop low, why, it's a sure sign of rain. And from that day on, the jackass has been a weather prophet and vice versa. <laughs> We're now sing the donkey serenade. <laughs> now, Winnie, you're still awake, aren't you? Eh? Yes, I am. Okay. Now, let's get back to your movie. Uh, wh which movie do you work for? The Pacific Drive-In Theater in Compton. Now, what's going on in your drive-in theater tonight, for Destination example? Destination Moon. What is it? <laughs> Destination Moon and Mr. Lucky. Uh -huh. Well, if I know drive-ins, there's more than that going on there. <laughs> Do 
You know, the last time I was at a drive-in, the movie stopped, and it was 40 minutes before a customer complained. <laughs> and he only complained about the mosquitoes. <laughs> How many people are there in the average car that come to your drive-in? Well, just a shade over two. <laughs> Well, that's certainly a handy thing to have at a drive-in. <laughs> Does anyone ever try to sneak into your drive-in? Oh, yes. Uh-huh. We have that happen. You do? Yes. Could, could you give me an example? Or how? Well, yes. Uh, one night, this one fellow came in alone. So uh, the usher sort of suspected something, and they followed him over and caught six other guys, or seven, I think it was, climbing out of the trunk. Or the turtle back, whatever it was. Imagine people being that dishonest, huh? Sneaking into a movie theater. Do you ever bother to look under the engine? <laughs> oh, no, I don't think you would hide there. Well, you should have. There weren't seven people in that boy's car. There were eight of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say you're an interesting couple, and if I decide to go to a drive-in theater, I'll consult a good groundhog first. <laughs> or that jackass. And uh, now, uh, let's see if uh, two heads are better than one. You're going to play your bet your life for a chance at $1,500. But first, here's something of importance. Everybody's talking about power steering, the new feature that helps you turn the steering wheel with so little effort. But wait. Before you buy any car with power steering, remember this. Only the DeSoto type is full power steering, offering you these three big advantages. First, it operates at all times, not just some of the time, but all of the time. Second, it's always predictable. The feel of the wheel never changes. Third, DeSoto's full power steering lets you turn the steering wheel from one extreme to the other in only three and a half turns instead of the conventional five and a half. Try the DeSoto type of full power steering. Go to your DeSoto Plymouth dealers and take the five-mile trial. Take the five-mile trial. Yes, take the five-mile trial in either the 160-horsepower DeSoto Fire Dome 8 or the famous DeSoto Power Master 6. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth, the low-priced car most like high-priced cars. Okay, now let's see if you two will get a chance at the $1,500. Fenneman? Explain the rules in your broken English. <laughs> All right. Each of our three couples has $20. They bet as much of that 20 as they want on each of four questions, and the couple that earns the most money gets a chance at the $1,500 DeSoto Plymouth question at the end of the show. That clear? Yes. All right, here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. You selected colors of flowers as your category. Now, here's your first question. How much of the 20 will you try? 16. What did you say? I said 10. We'll split it. 13. <laughs> All right. What color is a poinsettia? Red. Red is correct. <laughs> and you're on your way. You have $33. You're on your way with $33. Remember, you're going for $1,500. How much of the 33 will you bet on your second question? 20. Just a little, huh? Okay. 20, 26? 26. Okay. <laughs> All right. What color is a calla lily? White. White is correct. <laughs> $59. How much of the 59 are you going to go for? Fifty. Good. $50. What color is a daffodil? Yellow. Yellow is right. And you find more way to $109. $109 is your last chance to beat the other couple. How much of the 109 90 Okay. <laughs> $90. What color is a gardenia? White. White is correct. And you wind up with $199 from the DeSoto Plymouth dealers. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Groucho, the secret word is still heart. Yes, I know. Still heart is no good. Huh? Uh, just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected a weightlifter, Mr. Uh, John Farbotnik. And uh, his partner... Please, don't make up any names here. <laughs> give, us the, give us the names they actually are. We have enough trouble. The weightlifter's <laughs> name is Mr. John Farbotnik, and the housewife is Mrs. Regina Roberts. And here they are, folks. Meet Groucho Marx. Right up here. Welcome. Welcome to your Bet Your Life, kids. And if Hello, you say sir. the secret word, you'll divide $100. 
It's the common way. It's something you always have with you. Mr. John uh, Pabotnik. That's what it is. Doesn't seem possible, but that's what it is. <laughs> Gotta keep my trap shut. You're a weightlifter, huh? That's right. Weightlifter, huh? Where are you from? Muscle show? Well, originally I'm from Philadelphia, but I'm traveling. Let me get my laugh first, will you? Huh? <laughs> How would you like it if you said something brilliant and I rode right over it like that? <laughs> Where are you from? Muscle Shoals? <laughs> Went better the first time, I think. <laughs> Where are you from? Well, originally I'm from Philadelphia, but I've been traveling the last few years. Well, I'm sure that I can't help you out on that. Anyway. <laughs> Have you spoken to the police in these various cities? <laughs> you sure you're not from Muscle Shoals? No, I'm not. It's such a funny place to be from. Mrs. Roberts, uh, are you from Muscle Shoals? No, sir. Where are you from? New York, originally. Our, uh, wait, I forgot his name. Oh, John. I'll call you John, huh? I'll call you for botanic. That's easier than John. Huh? <laughs> are, are you married, John? Yes, I am. I've been married two years. And uh, what sort of work does your husband do, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Roberts? Uh, My husband's recuperating, sir. Well, that's nice why you didn't get it. <laughs> what do you mean? He's building chicken coops? No, sir. He was shot. He was a policeman in New York. Oh, well, I hope he wasn't seriously hurt, was he? He's feeling much better since we've been out here. Well, wish him speedy recovery for me, will you? Thank you very kind. Of. And uh, what did he do before... Uh, oh, he was a policeman, huh? Was he on the force very long? Seventeen and a half years. How, how did you meet him? My sister was expecting a baby. And you know how babies unexpectedly come. So I had heard that if you call the police department, they might bring assistance. So my husband, another policeman, came, and he delivered the baby. And then after that, he used to come to visit the baby as a pretext. He used to say he wanted to see how the baby was coming along. And he was really coming there to see your sister? No, he was coming to see me. And up to that time, I never had a sweetheart, so that was all right. <laughs> Said sweetheart, and you and John, uh, Mr. Fabotnik, are going to split a hundred dollars. Well, your husband's got fifty dollars tonight that he didn't have this morning. Huh? I have it. Well, there is a difference. Now, uh, Mr. Fabotnik, uh, uh, I'm fascinated. Have you got a nickname, or shall I keep calling you Fabotnik? Well, my friends usually call me Muscles. <laughs> Are you from Muscle Shows? <laughs> no, I'm not. Well, uh, what do you do? Uh... Well, I'm an instructor at the Physical Services Gymnasium at Westwood in Santa Monica, Boulevard. I see. Well, what kind of equipment do you have there? Well, we have toe-raising machines, we have leg-pressing machines, and uh, latissimus dorsi machines. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, <laughs> Machines develop your latissimus dorsi muscles of your Where upper Where is your latissimus dorsi? Or is it safe to ask them? Huh? <laughs> Don't uh, tell me it's in Santa Monica. Huh? <laughs> Where is the latissimus dorsi? Huh? Are the large muscles of your upper back that give you the taper from your shoulders to your waist. I see. You're speaking for yourself now, are you? <laughs> Samson, does all this weightlifting do you any good? Yes, it does. In, in, in what way? Well, I've seen fellows come into the gym and uh, train for... Uh, a year or so and come out with a perfect figure. Really? I went into a burlesque theater the other night. Within 15 minutes, I came out with a perfect figure. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell us something about your physique, uh, John. For example, have you ever won any uh, weightlifting contests? Yes, I have. I won Mr. Chicago in 1946. and You won Mr. Chicago? And Mr. Illinois after that, then Mr. California just lately. Wouldn't you rather win Miss Atlantic City? Or... <laughs> <laughs> you for Keats? <laughs> well, even if only temporarily. <laughs> I held a title one back in 1927. I was Mr. Spineless of 1927. <laughs> and I've never relinquished that title either. Well, there's no point, John, in having a perfect body if you don't show it to anybody. Uh, would you mind giving us a, a, a peek at your framework? Here? <laughs> Why not? You do it at the beach, don't you? Well, the beach is all right, but not in front of an audience. <laughs> well, this is hardly an audience. Just look at them, eh? <laughs> Go on, take, a, take your coat off and uh, show them. Uh, let's see what a real man looks like. Now, guys, restrain yourself out there. <laughs> Are you 
sure you're not from Muscle Shoals? <laughs> Say, are, are those real muscles? They sure are. They are. Yeah. <laughs> How often do you have to pump them up? <laughs> well, I exercise them three times a week. Uh, how big are your measurements on there? How, how big is your chest? That oh. is your chest there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> About 50 inches. 50 inches? Is that up and down or around? <laughs> <laughs> Say, John, would you object if Mrs. Roberts felt your muscles? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Go ahead, Mrs. Roberts. They won't bite you. <laughs> <laughs> now, Mrs. Roberts, how does your husband compare with his Greyhound bus? <laughs> He doesn't have those muscles, but I like him better. I, I see. I, I like my husband, but oh, you fanatic. Eh? <laughs> well, uh, John, figures don't lie, and yours is no exception. And neither is yours, Mrs. Roberts. Oh, gosh, thanks. Now, let's see how well you make out in the race for the $1,500. You've got to run your $20 into more than our other company. I can't tell you how much our first couple won, but Fenneman's off stage to remind our listeners. The weatherman and the drive-in theater cashier won $199. All right, you selected locations of countries. Now, you have $20. How much are you going to bet on your first question? Fifteen. 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 What country is directly west of Spain? Portugal. Portugal is right. <laughs> and welcome to this point, you have $35. How quickly you knew that, Mrs. Robinson. Huh? Remember, you're going for $1,500. Now, how much of the $30 will you bet $35. on? $35. $35 will you bet on your second $30. question? $30. $30. $30. 30 What country is directly east of Alaska? Canada. Canada is right. <laughs> now you have $65. Here's your third question. How much of the 65 $60. 60 What country is directly south of the United States? Mexico. 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 <laughs> $125. All right, now here's your last chance to beat the other couples. How much of the 125 are you going to go for? How much of the 25 are you going to go for? Here we go with the last whole thing. The whole, whole work. How much? Uh, the whole thing. The whole, the whole work. works? Please. You terrify me, Mrs. Rogers. <laughs> what country is directly east of Ireland? England. England, England is right. <laughs> and you wind up with $250 from the DeSoto Turnip Dealers of America. Thank thanks, you very thanks much. Thanks to both of Thank you. you. Well, Groucho, the secret word... Who's next word... on the agenda? I was going to tell you the secret word is still heart. Still heart. Yes. Uh, we invited some identical twins to the program tonight, and here they are. Talk slow so I can smoke. Mm -hmm. Miss Jane Luther and Miss Jean Luther meet Groucho Marx. Twins, eh? Yes, yes. Uh, welcome, welcome for the DeSoto, DeSoto, Plymouth, Plymouth, <laughs> dealer, dealer. <laughs> How are you? How are you? Huh? <laughs> And if you say the secret word, you'll divide $100 on it. No, just $100 in cash. <laughs> it's a common word, something you always have with you. Jane and Jean Luther. Huh? Mm -hmm. You're identical twins? Yes, we yeah. are. Double trouble. Eh? <laughs> Luther, eh? That's an odd name. Uh, which, which, which one is Jane? I'm Jane. You're Jane? And, and which one is June? There is no June. I thought June came right after me. <laughs> I'm Jean. Well, you're, oh, you're, you're Jean, huh? Mm -hmm. Did uh, Jane come after Jean, or did Jean come after Jane? Jean came right after Jane. How much after? Ten minutes. That long, eh? Well, I don't think that's very long. No, but it can be very important. <laughs> Another ten minutes, you might have been triplets. <laughs> now, let's get this straight so, so I know who I'm talking to. Now, left to right, uh, you're Jane and you're Jean. Is that right? No. I'm Jean and she's Jane. Well, who's Luther? We're both Luther. You're both Luther? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll just call you Sam and Hyman now. <laughs> After my two titles. Uh, uh, Jane, uh, you're Jane, huh? Yes. Yeah. Uh, wh where are you from originally? Born in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh-huh. Not in Walla Walla, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, they not only grow them big in Texas, they grow them double down there. <laughs> Very attractive, too. Huh? Thank you. Which one is thanking me? <laughs> now, Jean, this is only a wild guess, but I'll bet uh, you're from Fort Worth, too, aren't you? Yes, I am. <laughs> now, why am I so psychic? <laughs> Jane, I'm, I'm embarrassed to ask a woman point blank how old she is, so uh, tell me, how, how old is your sister? 
<laughs> well, she's ten minutes younger than I am. <laughs> That's twins for you. Double talk, eh? Jean, uh, how old are you? And don't tell me ten minutes younger than June. Twenty-eight. Oh, 28, eh? Then June must be uh, 10 minutes less than 28? No, no Jane. Right. June has 30 <laughs> days. <laughs> Jane, are, are you married, Jane? No, I'm not. In that case, Jean, you're not married either, am I right? That's right, I'm not married. You see, since you're both named Luther, you couldn't be married if your sister isn't. <laughs> well? Brother, am I shrewd? Just call me the fat man. <laughs> Now, Jean, I'm curious to know why you aren't married. You're, you're very attractive. I'm having too much fun just being single. <laughs> well, you may not be married, but you're certainly not single. <laughs> what do you mean, having too much fun? Uh, what do you consider fun? Well, I like to go dancing and skiing and ice skating, and I like to indulge in each sport with a different fellow. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, you're a three-man woman, is that it? <laughs> Now, you say you're identical twins. Do you like the same boys? Well, we leave that up to the boy. But do you find out that you like the same type yes, boys? Yes, we do. We like do. the same type. Well, that, that can be rather uh, embarrassing, can it? Huh? Yes, it If can. there's only one boy and they, you both like him? Huh? Well, we let him make his choice, and then it's up to him. Well, how does he know which one he's picking? <laughs> that runs into confusion. <laughs> and sometimes runs into money. <laughs> well, I must say it's been very confusing talking to you two. Now, let's see if you two have two heads are better than one. You're going to play your Bet Your Life for a chance at $1,500. That's the DeSoto Clement big question. I can't tell you how much our other couples won, but Fenneman is off stage to remind our listeners. The weightlifter and the housewife are ahead with $250. Here we go. Let's say how high I can build you $20. You select it. Name the song. Eh? Oh, am I going to get mixed up on this? Do you know any old songs, Fenneman? I hope so. I may need all your assistance <laughs> before I'm through here. Now, here's your first question. How much are you going to bet? Fifteen. Fifteen? Thirty, you're going to bet? You only no. have twenty, you know. <laughs> Fifteen. Oh, seven and a half apiece. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> da-dum, da-dum, da-da-da-dum, da-da-dum, da-da-da-dee. Old Lang Syne. Old Lang Syne is right. <laughs> <laughs> These wins are on your way. You have thirty-five dollars. Thirty-five dollars. Remember, you're going for one thousand five hundred clams tonight. Now, how much of the thirty-five are you going to bet? Thirty. Thirty. If a body meets a body... Come and fray the tune. Coming through the right. Coming through the right. <laughs> <ride. laughs> now you have sixty-five dollars. Boy, did I come through the right the other night, huh? <laughs> Here's your third question. How much of the sixty-five you gonna go for? Sixty. Sixty. <laughs> Oh, listen to the Mockingbird. Listen to the Mockingbird. (laughs) You're really on your way, girls. You have $125. And a finer rendition of the Mockingbird, you'll go a long ways to hear. (laughs) It's your last chance to beat the other couples. No, couples. That's the problem. You take up a foreign language. You don't know what you're reading. <laughs> now, how, much, how much money have you got? I have $125. Well, that's a vast mm-hmm. sum. You know that? that? You, and how much are you betting? All of it. All, All of it? Of it? <laughs> oh, my darling Clementine. Oh, my darling Clementine is right. <laughs> <laughs> and, Groucho, if my figures... And the are... <laughs> too. <laughs> Roger, my figures are correct. And your figures really are correct, <laughs> Adam. Innes. This time I think they are. They wind up with two hundred and fifty dollars, and that means we're in a tie because the weightlifter and the housewife also won with two hundred and fifty dollars. Well, land sake, huh? So we'll bring them both up and let them both have a chance in a big question. <laughs> with the big Fourth of July weekend coming up. Chances are you'll be out driving. And before you go, make sure your car is roadworthy by giving it a complete checkup at your DeSoto Plymouth dealers. There, master technicians, experienced on the job, trained in factory methods, and using the most modern tools and equipment, will tune up your engine so it really sings. They'll check brakes and lights and other vital safety features and make any necessary repairs. Also, if a new part is needed... Your DeSoto Plymouth dealer can supply you immediately with the right factory-approved parts. Remember, visit your DeSoto Plymouth dealers first 
And keep in mind that wherever you drive, you'll always be near one of the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers of America. Here are our winning couples, Groucho. The weightlifter and the housewife and the identical twins. Now, you both have 15 seconds to write down an answer to our big $1,500 question. Here's a pencil for you two, a piece of paper and a pencil for you two. And if you... You know, I don't know how... <laughs> if they both get the answer, they'll split the money between them. That's the answer. And yeah, if the one team gets part. the answer, they win all the money. Let's figure. You see how simple it is when I do it? <laughs> All right, here we go for $1,500. Between England and Ireland, there is a body of water. For $1,500, tell me, what is the name of this body of water? Irish Straits and... Uh, the twin said the whale sea, which is incorrect, so I think that the Mr. Fanatnik over here and Mrs. Roberts. <laughs> You're all right, kid. You're all right. I'm sorry you couldn't vote, man. But you won a lot of money anyhow, huh? Well, that's right. You win $1,500. Come over here, kids, and tell us what are you going to do with that money. What are you going to do with your money, Mrs. Roberts? My children have been asking for a television set for so long. I think I can buy them one. The, re- the correct answer, technically, is the Irish Sea, but they said the Irish Straits, and we think that's close enough for them to win the money. <laughs> now, Muscle Shows, what are you going to do with your swag? <laughs> I just want to feel it for a while. <laughs> Now, let's see. You won $1,500 plus $250 in the quiz. Say, so you really cleaned up tonight. They had the secret word, too. And the secret yeah. word, eh? Well, let's see. $1,750 $1, you're splitting. Well, congratulations from the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. You bet your life. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night at this same time for the best of Groucho from the You Bet Your Life series. Don't miss the best of Groucho on television, too. Also presented by the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers of America. And remember, all dealers who sell DeSoto also sell Plymouth. Two great cars, both products of the Chrysler Corporation. And when you drive in, tell them Groucho sent you. Good night, folks, and remember, see the DeSoto Fire Dome 8... Tomorrow. Folks, here's a rhyme from the National Safety Council. The rules for driving safely add up to only three. Common sense and caution and common courtesy. You Bet Your Life, transcribed from Hollywood, is produced by John Goodell. Directed by Robert Dwan and Bernie Smith. Music by Jerry Fielding. This is George Fenneman signing off for the more than 3,000 DeSoto Plymouth dealers from coast to coast. Bill Goodwin speaking for Lever Brothers, makers of Swan, the new white floating soap that's purer than finest Castile. Well, it's Tuesday night again, time for another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen, Jimmy Cash, and Paul Whiteman and his music. And now meet the people who live in the Burns house, George and Gracie. Well, this is the Burns' first morning back home after a brief visit to the east. 
And George is still sound asleep upstairs, peacefully unaware that at this moment a meeting is going on in his living room. Yes, you guessed it. It's that splendid organization whose very name is enough to give George the horrors, the Beverly Hills Uplift Society. It's time for the meeting. Oh, but Gracie, we want to hear some more about New York. Yes, it must be such a fascinating place. Oh, well, New York is just a city girl. It's exactly like Los Angeles. Only New York grew up and Los Angeles grew sideways, that's all. <laughs> Gracie, maybe you better open up the meeting. It's getting late. Oh, yeah, of course, Gracie. All right. Uh, ladies of the Beverly Hills Uplift Society, you may now consider yourselves opened up. <laughs> um, girls, while I was away, Vicki Gruskin took the minutes of the last meeting, and I think we all owe her a round of applause for her splendid work. Girls, a big hand for Vicki Gruskin. <laughs> all right, that's enough, Vicki. <laughs> um, I'll proceed with the minutes. <clears throat> the, um, the last meeting of the Beverly Hills Upper Society was to have been held at the home of Mrs. Millie Taylor, but when her husband heard the news, he raised several objections at a floor lamp. <laughs> however, however, the incident ended harmlessly when Mrs. Taylor grabbed it out of his hand and knocked out three of his front teeth with it. <laughs> My husband has a perfectly vicious temper. He certainly has. Yes, Millie. I'm afraid that someday he'll get really mad at you and you'll kill him. <laughs> Gracie, go ahead with a minute. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, we then decided to hold a meeting at the home of Mrs. George Burns, who was away in the east. So we entered through a second-story window. It was such fun, Gracie. I hadn't shinnied up a drain pipe since I was a little girl. Really, Blanche? Yes, and that was easily ten years ago. Oh, easily. <laughs> well, to continue, the meeting was declared open by Mrs. Bagley, who wore the same old Kelly Green dress and a fascinator that obviously wasn't working. <laughs> oh, really, Vicky? You shouldn't let personalities creep into the minutes. Well, I'm sorry, Great. Well, you ought to be. There's no need to say things like that about our members. They know how badly they dress. Well, I didn't mean to. Oh, my, there's the door. Excuse me, girl. Yes, oh, right there. oh, hello, Mr. Postman. Good morning, Mrs. Burns. Gosh, it's wonderful to see you again. Oh, did you really miss me? I should say I did. I missed your sparkling wit and your madcap gaiety, which is so similar to my own. Oh, 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 you're sweet. Honestly, I haven't had a good laugh since you left. May I have one now? Well, of course. Go right ahead. <laughs> now I feel better. Oh. Well, did you ever make a trip to New York, Mr. Postman? No, but I do correspond with a man who lives there, a Mr. Charles Atlas. He gives a course in bodybuilding. Oh. And uh, you take it? Oh, no. I just write in and give him helpful hints. <laughs> My body doesn't need improvement. It would be gilding a lily. Oh, I'm sorry. I just forgot how strong you are. No offense, Mrs. Burns. This uniform hides my physique. But in the gymnasium, all my friends say that I'm built like a brick chimney. <laughs> you are. Well, here's your mail, Mrs. Burns. A little package from New York. Oh, a package? Oh, good. I'm so glad it came in time for the meeting. Goodbye, Mr. Postman. Goodbye, Mrs. Burns. And remember, keep smiling. Come <laughs> <laughs> back to water, girls. Come back to water. Now, in a little while, I'll have a surprise for you. But first, we better get on with the meeting. Is there any old business? Yes, Gracie. We still haven't decided on the official club flower for us girls to wear. And we haven't decided on our official club greeting either. Well, girls, I had a marvelous idea about that. We can combine both of them. Really, Gracie? How? Well, now, for the club flower, we can wear goldenrod. And for the club greeting, we can sneeze at each other. <laughs> oh, I think that's splendid, don't you, girls? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hello, Gracie. Oh, hello, Bill. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know I was interrupting a meeting. Oh, it's all right, Bill. Bill, you all remember Bill Goodwin? <laughs> Gracie, look. Don't ever have Charles Boyer over here. You know, if they do that for me, for him, they'd blow the walls down. 
<laughs> well, I really came over to see George. Where is he, Gracie? Oh, he's still in bed, Bill. You see, he couldn't get any sleep on the train last night. He just laughed all night long. He laughed? Yes, he shared his breath with my darling little duck. And you know how ticklish George is. <laughs> yes, Grace. Well, I'll, I'll go wake him up. Oh, now that you're here, Mr. Goodwin, we simply must take advantage of this opportunity. Must we? Yes. <laughs> we know that you and Tootsie were in New York together. And we're dying to know whether you two lovebirds became more intimate. <laughs> oh, now, wait a minute, Tootsie. I hardly saw you in New York, except when I happened to pass in front of the YMCA. <laughs> but you gave me a cake for my birthday, Bill. Well, Tootsie, I give all my friends a cake for their birthday. See, it's a wonderful soap, isn't it? <laughs> yes, sir, there's nothing like a cake of swan, the new white floating soap. It's purer than finest Castiles and a regular suds and whiz. Bill, I've got a new use for swan soap. You have, Tootsie? Uh-huh. I put it under my pillow so I'll dream of you. Oh. <laughs> well, gee, thanks, Tootsie. You know, um, I dreamed about you last night. Really? Oh, yes. I dreamed that you were Mrs. Goodwin. Oh, oh how wonderful. Bill, what were we doing? Washing the dishes with swan. <laughs> Goodwin, huh? Oh, yes, Tootsie, you were Mrs. Goodwin. You were washing the dishes, and I put my arms around you, and I said, let me help you, Mother. <laughs> mother? Well, well, sure, and you said, no, son, with swan in the dishpan, I don't need any help. Tests show that swan suds faster than other white floating soaps, and it's so mild, and just look how it helps keep my hands soft and lovely. And I said, that's right, Mom. Use Swan for every soap and water job around the house. Bill, how could you dream that I was your mother? Well, I'll tell you, you remind me of her a lot, Tootsie. The way your eyes light up when you break a bar of Swan in two. The way you walk as you put half of it in the kitchen for dishes and cleaning and the other half in the bathroom for your hands and face to tub or shower. Uh, well, goodbye, girl. Oh, wait, Bill. You said I remind you of your mother. Well, don't you always kiss your mother goodbye? Oh, sure I do. <laughs> Well... Well, Tootsie, see me Mother's Day. <laughs> so long, girl. Good morning, George. Hey, George. Oh, hello, Bill. I was just coming down. Oh, gee. What a great sleep I had. Ah, home sweet home. Yeah. Gracie probably has a wonderful breakfast all fixed. Come on. Have a cup of coffee with us, Bill. Uh, George, I wouldn't go in there. Let's have a cup of coffee at the drugstore. Oh, huh? not me, Bill. It's too noisy and crowded down there. I like peace and quiet. Uh, George, don't go in there. Why not? It's my own little home. My own little love nest. Come on, Bill. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> this is Paul White. Here's a song you've heard before and you'll hear again. So the right title for it is I've heard that song before.
Gracie, this is fine. After all I've said, our very first day home, you invite those idiotic women here again. George, I've asked you a thousand times not to call them idiots. And I've asked you a thousand times not to invite them here. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's compromise. You let me invite them here, and I'll let you call them idiots. <laughs> well, I'm at the end of my rope. I've tried arguing with you, threatening you, pleading with you, even bribing you. I don't know what else to do. Well, let me see now. Why, it is difficult to think of anything, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, have you tried beating me? No. Ah, oh, you see? You're always ready to give up. Yeah, but beating you is one thing I can't do. How do you know? I'm not as strong as I look. <laughs> okay, I know when I'm late. I'm done. Finished through. Ah, oh, that's the old spirit. Now you're talking that a boy. <laughs> Gracie, won't you please give up that club? Oh, if you only knew the girls better, you wouldn't ask me to do that, dear. Why, do you know that they're waiting for me to come back right now so they can give me a medal? They're going to give you a medal? Mm hmm To commemorate my concert in Carnegie Hall last week. Uh, who, uh, who thought that up? One of the very women you were just saying all those nasty things about. Who? Me. <laughs> Well, that's very sweet of you giving yourself a medal. I know, but I deserve it. Oh, oh sure, 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 sure. I, I made musical history when I played the piano in Carnegie Hall. Why, one critic said I was as good as Post. As good as, as, as who? Post. He said I played with all the depth and feeling of a Post. <laughs> oh, yeah, great musician, that Post. Mm-hmm. I've Tall, been... skinny fella. Well, I don't know it. No, I well. wish you'd come in with me and watch the ceremony, George. The postman just brought the medal, and it's simply beautiful. It's got a picture of me on one side and a picture of a fish on the other. A fish? Yes. Well, you see, I figured out that I played the scale 196 times in Carnegie Hall last week. And, well, if you count the scales on the fish... I get it. I get it. You don't have to finish it. I yeah. see the whole thing. Well, will you, will you come in with me and listen to the presentation speech, dear? Well, why not? I might as well be good and miserable. Um, girls, girls, I took the liberty of bringing my husband back into the meeting with me. Um, all those in favor of making him our guest of honor will please say aye. Uh, all those in favor of just making him a guest, please say aye. Uh, oh, all those in favor of not throwing him out, please say aye. <laughs> Aye, sit down. Uh, thanks, thanks. <laughs> and uh, now, girls, it's time for my surprise. The presentation of the Gracie Allen Memorial Achievement Award. Well, <laughs> well it's, um, it's a medal which will be given each year to the member who has done most to make our club famous. <laughs> now, um, I'm the first winner because I not only made a recent contribution to musical history, but I also bought a medal. Oh, well, I But who knows what the future may hold. Next year, Frances Fowler might win it with those new false eyelashes she invented. Oh, well, they're really nothing, Gracie. Why, I think they're clever. You should see them, George. They have 48 hairs, and when you go to the market, you pull one hair out for every ration point. <laughs> then, when your eyelashes are all gone... You, you stop buying. Yes, I thought that that's that's very, that's very clever. I did. Yes. Yes. Well, now, who'd like to make the presentation speech? How about you, Clara? Oh, uh, uh, Gracie, I simply couldn't. I, I've never made a speech. Well, it won't be hard. All you have to do is read what I wrote. You, you wrote the speech yourself. Thank Every you. word of it. Here you are, Clara. Go ahead. <clears throat> Ladies of the Beverly Hills Uplift Society, it is my privilege to pay a greatly deserved honor to our most talented and illustrious member. Oh, please. Oh, no. <laughs> no artist of our time has done more to further the cause of music than this charming and lovely young woman. Oh, my goodness, you're making me blush. <laughs> Her accomplishments have thrilled the nation, yet through it all, she has remained modest and, um, oh, what's this word, Gracie? Oh, let's see. Oh, unassuming. Oh, okay. <laughs> she has remained modest and unassuming. Oh, and don't think it's been easy. Oh, no. <laughs> so, I take pleasure in presenting the Gracie Allen Memorial Achievement Award to Gracie Allen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know what to say. Your wonderful tribute has caught me completely unprepared. (laughs) 
Well, I've had all I can stand. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> well, so help me. If something isn't done to get those buzzards out of my hair. Well, brother, I'm... they've really got you talking to yourself. They certainly have, Bill. I'm going nuts. That club is making an old man out of me before my time. Oh, now, George, why get so excited about a few months? <laughs> Well, no fooling, Bill. If Gracie doesn't get rid of that club, it's going to ruin my health. Say, wait a minute. George, if you pretend you're ill, maybe she'll throw him out. Oh, she'd know it was a phony. Well, she wouldn't if her own doctor told her you were sick. You mean that Dr. Lewis, that absent-minded crackpot? Well, now, wait. Gracie thinks he's a great doctor, even though in his case the M.D. does stand for mentally deficient. Mm. <laughs> now, you get him to tell her the club is ruining your health, and that's the end of it. Bill, you're wonderful. I love you. I could kiss you for this. Oh, George, please remember, you're a married man. Oh, how can I forget it? <laughs> Jimmy Cash has got the right thought about any loose talk you might hear around these days. I don't believe in rumors. Okay, Jimmy, we'll go right ahead. It's a dangerous thing to repeat what you hear When you don't even know what they're saying is true Somebody else told somebody else And that somebody said we were through But I don't believe in rumors, darling I want it straight from you Wherever I walk, the people all talk And they're saying it's time that I knew But I don't believe in rumors, darling I want it straight from you When the gossips are doing their work But somehow I feel If the stories were real You would have come to me first Whatever they say And say what they may Still it isn't the thing you would do Oh, I won't believe That screwball, Dr. Lewis. I phoned him an hour ago. Now, stop worrying. He'll get here, and when he does, you'll be a free man. Bill, if this idea works, I'll owe you a big favor. Just name the thing you want most, and I'll get it for you. Oh, you couldn't do that, George. You don't know Paul Ed Goddard that well. <laughs> oh, well, in that case, Bill... Well, here's Dr. Lewis. Hope he isn't as absent-minded as he used to be. Come in. How do you do? Is this the residence of Dr. Lewis? Well, here we go again. <laughs> Look, uh, you're Dr. Lewis, and I asked you to come here. Oh, to be sure, to be sure. Yes. Well, I can see that an examination won't be necessary. You're mistaken. That's all mistaken. Look, uh, Doc, all I want you to do I'm is... sorry, but you're definitely not going to become a mother. Uh, better luck there. <laughs> uh, hey, Doc, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Doc. Uh, no, I can't wait. I have an appointment with a man named Burns. He phoned and said that his wife's health was bad since he hit her with a club. Uh, Dr. Lewis, you're just a little mixed up. This is Mr. Burns, and his health is bad because his wife's club holds its meetings here. Ah, oh, I understand. My wife belongs to a club, too, and I often say to her, Catherine, uh, th no, that's not her name. Isabel? No. Nancy? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, how about, how about Mrs. Lewis? I'd love to meet her. Any friend of yours is a friend of mine. <laughs> Doctor, look. All you have to do is tell my friend's wife that he's sick. Ah, but is he? I have to be sure. A man in my profession can't afford to go off half a uh, uh, bait, uh, chalk, uh, crack. Oh, for Pete's sake. Oh, you're a very nervous man, Mr. Sake. May I call you Pete? <laughs> Look, uh, Doctor, I'm George Burns. Go right in there and tell my wife that those club meetings are ruining my health. Got it? Oh, sure. I never forget a face. Right this way, Doc. Oh, Gracie. 
Gracie, a friend of yours would like to speak to you. Oh, hello, Dr. Lewis. I'm awfully glad to see you. I'm delighted to see you, too. Who are you? <laughs> well, I'm Mrs. Burns. Don't you remember? I introduced you to my girlfriend, Tootsie Sagwell, and you took her out. I did? Well, you didn't exactly take all of her out, just the council. <laughs> Doc. Will you please tell her about Mr. Burns' health? Oh, to be sure. Mr. Health is proud of his Burns, and he should be. First degree, you know. <laughs> Goodbye, Dr. Lewis. I'll beat it. Scram, oh, I'd like to, but I haven't time. I've got to go. <laughs> now, wait a minute, girl. What Dr. Lewis was trying to tell you is this. These club meetings of yours are ruining George's health. Oh, oh no! no. <laughs> well, it's true. Why, when I walked in here this morning, he was as sick as he could be. He looked up at me with that pitiful little face of his... And he said, water, water, bring me water. So I gave him water and a bar of swan, the new white floating soap. That's purer than finest Castile's. I knew he'd want that. George knows that money can't buy a purer soap. Bill, are you serious? Is George really sick? Gracie, I don't want to frighten you, but poor old George is as weak as a little baby. Thank goodness you've got swan, because swan is great for babies. It's so pure, it's mild, too, kind even to a little baby's tender skin. So you know it must be wonderful for anybody's hands and face, tub or shower. You just bathe them with Swan. He'll pull through. Oh, isn't this awful, girls? Oh, oh, God. God. Oh, really, I never dreamed how club meetings were making George ill. Yes, Gracie. And it's high time you women considered George. Just as you've long considered Castile soaps the standard of purity. Of course, you know that Swan is even purer than finest Castile. Oh, all right, Bill. You don't have to say any more. Then, then you'll help him, Gracie? Well, of course I will. After all, I married George for better or for worse. It would be awful if he got any worse. Well, that's fine, Gracie. I'll, I'll go in and tell him he's as good as cured. George. Yeah? It's all set. Come on, upstairs. You mean it worked? Yeah, yeah, hurry. All you have to do is get into bed and act sick and no more club. Oh, great. Here, give me your robe. Okay. I'll get into bed. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. Get out of my bed, you silly-looking duck. Out, out. <laughs> Shut up. Now, remember, George, get a sad look on your face. We've got to make this good if we're going to fool Gracie into thinking you're sick. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Herman. <laughs> look. Uh, look, kid, it's, 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 it's sort of a game, that's all, a game. <laughs> quiet, quiet. For goodness sake, Herman, take it easy. Look, if you, if you keep your big fat bill shut about this... I'll give you a nice sardine. What do you say? Uh, -uh. <laughs> uh two sardines? Uh -uh. Oh, holding out, huh? Well, two sardines is as far as I'll go. Uh -uh. Okay, okay, quiet, quiet, quiet. I'll give you the whole can. Uh -uh. <laughs> now go on. Beat it, you little blackmailer. <laughs> Oh. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to take that little duck. Hey, do I hear Gracie coming up the stairs? Yeah, I think so. Hurry, get sick. Groan. Oh. Oh, put something into it. You're supposed to be sick. Groan. Oh. George, is that the best you can do? Think of your income tax. Oh. <laughs> That's it. Now keep going. Oh, oh, George, oh. George, darling, I heard you were terribly sick, dying maybe, so I rushed right up here the minute we finished discussing Mrs. Tomtag's new hairdo. Oh, oh, thanks, dear. Oh. oh, what's the matter, dear? Where have you got a pain? All over. Oh, dear, you couldn't have it in a worse place. <laughs> oh. oh, stick out your tongue, George. Uh. Oh, my goodness, no wonder you're sick with a thing like that in your mouth. <laughs> Oh, Gracie, come on. You're holding up the meat. Yes, I'm going to get Now, girl, please, please. please. My husband is desperately ill. How dare you think that I'd leave his side to go downstairs and attend a silly meeting? Oh. I love my husband, and I'm going to stay with him. Why, if anything happened to George and I wasn't here, I'd never forgive myself. Thank you, darling. So we'll hold our meeting right in this room. Oh, my God. No, no, no. Well,
Our friends, George and Gracie, will be back in a moment. So for just a few seconds, consider your two hands. Yes, I mean it. Your two hands, ladies, are two of the best possible reasons for using Swan soap in the dishpan and for any soap and water job. Swan is purer than finest Castiles. Swan is so mild, it actually helps protect your hands, helps keep them soft and lovely. Swan doesn't skimp you on suds, either. Tests show it gives twice as many suds in a minute as other white floating soaps. So why use strong soaps? Why spend money on easy-to-waste package soaps or costly toilet soaps? No need to when you can get Swan, the soap that's purer than finest Castile. And now here they are again, George and Gracie. George, you shouldn't say mean things about our club. The girls are very patriotic. They are, huh? Well, yes. Today at the meeting, I was supposed to serve them pancakes and butter. But they were so patriotic, they refused to touch a single pancake. All they ate was our butter. <laughs> our butter? Gracie, haven't you been reading the paper? You can't get that anymore. Oh, was it butter? We thought it was batter. Oh. <laughs> the makers of Swan, the new white floating soap, join George and Gracie in inviting you to tune in to your CBS station again next week, same time. Remember, George Burns and Gracie Allen, CBS, next Tuesday night. And don't forget to listen to Swan's other show, Tommy Riggs and Betty Lou, next Friday night over another network. And now, till next week at the same time, this is Bill Goodwin saying, Well, I, Swan, how about you? Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. KMX, Columbia Square, Los Angeles. Johnny Lee, Jeff Alexander, and his orchestra, and radio's all-time favorite, Amos and Andy. Brought to you by Lever Brothers Company, makers of new 1950 Rinso with Solium. The soap that gets your clothes whiter and brighter than new. Rinso white, Rinso white, Rinso new. ago, the kingfish came into possession of a rather ancient automobile, which he's now trying to sell. The used car dealers laughed. The newspapers wouldn't even accept his ad. So finally, he's fallen back on what he knows from experience is his most likely customer. Well, there you is, Andrew. Yeah, ain't it a beauty? Yeah, uh, tell me, have you ever seen a car like this before? No, I can't say I is. Of course, I was only 42 years old. <laughs> And uh, this car ain't old, you know. It's one of the last models that was made in 1926. Yeah, oh, it's a great shape. It's had 300,000 miles of careful driving. <laughs> yeah, look at it there. Nice uh, light blue color with a yellow stripe on it. Yeah, you know, I've been looking at the thing here. Just what make is this, Kingfish? It don't look like nothing that I've ever seen. Well, I'll explain that to you, Andy. Uh, you see, over the years, this beautiful car has got to be a combination of the best features of a lot of different makes. Yeah. Well, is, is that a romantic? Oh, certainly. Where else is you going to find a car with a Stutz Bearcat motor and an Essex rear end? <laughs> well, look here. I'll tell you what you do. Why don't you hop in the car there and start the motor up there and listen to some nice running? Yeah, I'll get around over here. Uh. Hey, Kingfish, there ain't no door here on the driver's side. Well, uh, there ain't supposed to be, and there's an emergency exit. <laughs> It's by order of the fire department. The other three doors don't open at all, you see. <laughs> uh, go ahead now. Sit behind the wheel there and start up, son. Uh, yeah. Push the button and listen to a purr. I'll crank it at the same time you push that. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Henry, how'd you like the sound of that stuck Bearcat engine under the hood there? It sounds like the bear's trying to claw its way out to me. <laughs> Tell me this. How come it stall like that? Oh, ain't nothing serious. And the most likely they gasoline. One of them octanes must jammed in the transmission there, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know about this car. I like them new ones with the hydroerratic drive on them. <laughs> i tell you what, though. Uh, I might consider the thing if the price was right. How much you want for it? Well, I know the best price is $20, but if you want the extras, like the motor and the wheels, we'll run you up to... <laughs> That stuff be $400. $400? Mm-hmm. Kingfish, I ain't interested in the car. You ain't? No, definitely not. 
I don't want no part of that car, and don't ever mention it to me again, neither. That's right, Andrew. Keep an open mind on it, sir. Uh. <laughs> Tell you, sleep over the thing overnight. We'll request it again tomorrow. All right. Uh, where are you going now, Kingsley? Well, let's see what time it is. Uh, six o'clock. Uh, I've got to take uh, Sapphire to some dance tonight. Mm-hmm. I think I'll step on into Lloyd's Hall here and take a little cat nap. You know, I was a little tired, Andrew. Oh, hmm. Must have left the lights on. Wait a minute. That light's coming from the outside. Must be the northern light. <laughs> mm, maybe that's the roar boric acid coming in. <laughs> oh, oh, let me look at my watch here and see what time it is. Holy smokes, it's five o'clock in the morning. Where is I? I gotta get home. I gotta take Sapphire to a dance eight hours ago. <laughs> oh, I'm late. What'll I do? Now let's see. Wait a minute, that's funny. My car ain't in front of the lodge hall here where I left it. I wonder who... Holy smokes, it's way down the end of the block. Who in the world has been using my car? Well, I can't worry about it now. I got to get home and get there quick. Oh, me. Well, I'll get on in the house here. Good. Ain't no lights on. Thank goodness Sapphire is still asleep. I gotta be careful. This is like going into a cage of wild bears. <laughs> is that you, George Davis? Oh, oh, the old grizzly is awake. <laughs> uh, good morning, sweetheart. Uh, <laughs> I thought I'd hit the ball early this morning. Uh, got dressed, uh, made my bed up and everything. Just leaving the house. Don't you give me that. Why you been all night? Well, now look here, honey. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. I will believe you, George. I tell you, you won't believe me. I will believe you. All right, I dozed off at the large hall and didn't wake up till now. I don't believe you. Well, but that's the truth, honey. I was there for 11 hours. It was one of the deepest dozes I ever had. <laughs> Lucky I had three cups of coffee before I went under, I'd still be going. <laughs> Not only that, George Stevens, but you were supposed to take me to a dance last night. Yeah, I know. I had to go to the thing unassorted, and nobody danced with me. It was your place to be there. Well, that wouldn't have done no good. I can't force nobody to dance with you. <laughs> yeah, I have tired, tried a lot of times there. Made a lot of enemies that way. Say, there's something I want to ask you. By any chance, did you come over to Lodge Hall and use my car to go to that dance? George, you must be out of your head. I wouldn't go near that old car. Well, that's saying somebody moved my car. I parked in front of the Lodge Hall this morning, and I found it a block away from there where I parked it. Listen, I ain't interested in your old car. And what's more, you certainly got your nerve coming home at this hour and expecting me to believe a trumped up story like that. What do you think I am, no how? <laughs> Listen, if I told you, it would only start another argument. <laughs> you no more. I'm going in the bedroom, coming in here with a crazy story like that. You was a fine wife. All I does is ask for a little understanding and I don't get it. I tell you one thing, Sapphire. It'll be a dark day before I ask you for anything again. That suits me fine, you big bum. <laughs> Whoever made up that expression about a man's better hair ought to get a load of her. <laughs> Well, I ain't going to be able to go back to sleep now. I'll just sit up here in the front room. I'll turn on the radio. Oh, me. Life really got its problems already. Those the current developments on the European front up to this moment. Now for the local scene. In a daring pre-dawn robbery, a lone gunman burglarized the Robbins Jewelry Store on Lenox Avenue. A loss of over $2,000 in jewels was reported. The only clue to the identification of the gunman is that he made his getaway in a light blue sedan with a yellow stripe around it. <laughs> the door on the driver's side was missing. Oh, me. What did he say? The police have started a citywide hunt. In Washington, the Congress... Holy smoke. So oh, that's what's happened to my car. Oh, me. It was used in a robbery. They can't send this on me. They could, they, uh... Oh, can they? Oh, me. 
Sapphire, I gotta talk to you. I need your help. You need my help. You certainly got a short memory. Only a one minute ago, you said it would be a dog day before you ever ask me for anything again. Honey, the eclipse is here. I... <laughs> Brighter than you, rinse so white with rinse so new, rinse so white, whiter than you, rinse so white, brighter than you, rinse so white, rinse so white, rinse so new, rinse so new. It's an amazing fact. 1950 Rinso with Solium gets white clothes whiter, washable colors brighter than new, rinse so new. Even on rainy days, rinse so puts sunshine in your wash. No other soap can make your wash so white, so bright. Because no other soap contains the scientific sunlight ingredient, solium. 1950 Rinso gets out more dirt. Yes, gets out more dirt than any other type of wash day product. Yet Rinso is so safe for clothes, so kind to your hands. Get Rinso today. See your wash become whiter, brighter than new. Rinso white, Rinso white, Rinso new. Happy little one Come in, Henry. Hello, King. Say, what's wrong with you? I never see you look so worried. Well, I is, Henry, but uh, I just can't tell you about it. Oh, Kingfish, you can confide in me. After all, I have been your intricate friend for years. <laughs> tell me this. Did you read in the paper about the jewelry store robbery? Yes, I did. Well, Henry, my car was used in that robbery. The police was looking for the car. The thing is, I was asleep in the large hall doing the robbery. So I ain't got no alibi to prove that I didn't pull the job. Well, ain't there nobody that could testify that you were sleeping there? Nobody seen me. I ain't got no witness. Yes, you was in a bit of a jam. On top of having no alibi, your absence at the dance last night had everybody talking. It did, huh? Oh, yes. Sapphire tried to cover it up by saying you was working. That brought down the house. <laughs> Henry, this thing is closing in on me. What must I do? Well, the only way that they can link you with the crime is through the car. The obvious thing is to dispose of the car. Yeah, that's right. Dispose of the car. Mm -hmm. And I think I know just the disposal unit to use. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get rid of that car fast because they could convict me of the jewelry store robbery on circumstantial evidence yeah. alone. Yes, they could. Why isn't it mess, Henry? Yes, I'd say you were, King Fish. Now, listen, Henry. You don't by no chance think that I committed the jewelry store robbery, though, do you? Oh, no, King Fish. I've known you for a long time. I know your habits and your character. You would never commit any such crime. Thanks, Henry. That makes me feel better. By the way, uh, when the heat is off, I hope you let me have first crack at that jewelry. Yeah, yeah. Well, come in, Brother Henry. Hey, Kingfish, you don't left a message up at my place for me to come over here. What do you want to see me about? Well, then, you old pal... Hold it. Hold it right there. Now. <laughs> Whatever it is, I don't want to hear about it. Yeah, well, what? what's the matter then? Listen, I don't want to hear nothing that starts out with Andy, old pal. I can never afford it. <laughs> oh, no, Andy. I asked you to come over here to do you a favor. Oh, what's that? And I done reconsidered about that car of mine. I don't care what you has done. I ain't paying no $400 for that junkie. Well, now, that's what I just getting at, Andy. I has done shaved the price a little. If you act fair, you can have the thing for $2. $2. <laughs> Well, I don't know, Kingfish, you see. Uh, would I... you take the car if I give you $2? Well, <laughs> um, that is the truth, Kingfish. Would you take the car if I give you $400? Listen, Kingfish, the thing I want to know is why is you so anxious to get rid of this car all of a sudden? Well, then, uh, I can see that you ain't heard about the economic conditions of the country. What do you mean by that, now? Well, you remember last year how the automobile business went from a seller's market to a buyer's market? Mm, yeah, I heard something about that. Well, yesterday, the thing took a turn for the worse. It's now what they call a giver's market. <laughs> you mean to say, Kingfish, you want to give me the car for nothing? Yeah, and uh, I know when I was licked, boy, you really got me over a barrel. Yeah, you really sensed the trend of the time, you know? I did. Oh, y'all still playing dumb on me, huh? <laughs> you was a slicky, all right. <laughs> I know when I was beat, Andy. Uh, look here, I got the contract all filled out here. I don't already sign my name on it. Right there where it says victim. See that? There's my name. Right <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I guess I was pretty smart, all right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, then, uh, yeah. Take the pen and put your John Hancock right there. Right on them dots. Right on top of them. Okay, Kingfish. 
Hey, look here, I just noticed something. You done dated this thing wrong. This was dated last Wednesday. But yes, ain't it now? I had to make the thing retroactive so that you own the car as of last Wednesday, you see. You see, this is Sunday, and Sunday's always been illegal business for everybody except delicatessen stores, you know, and something like that. Fine <laughs> right there, and right, right on them dots, right on yeah, top well, of them. All right, all right. Well, put uh, the full name there, there. There you is. Andrew Hogg Brown. <laughs> Yeah, uh, congratulations, Andy. You are now a full-fledged retroactive car owner with no kickback. Yeah. You know, Kingfish, for a minute there, I think you were trying to chip me. But like you say, I was too smart for you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hi, Amos. Come in. Well, oh, hello there, boy. Say, Kingfish, I was just talking to Henry Van Porter. That's terrible your car being used in that hold-up last night. Uh, what was that? Uh, tell Frank about your car there, Andy. And if there's any way I can help you in your trouble, just call on me. See you later, Andy. Hey, Kingfish, you sit right where you are. You ain't going no place. Yeah, well, now, wait a minute. Let go of my neck. You ride. sit back down there. Oh, here. fellas, now, take it easy. Kingfish, I'm going to beat you to a pulp. Then I'm going to beat up the pulp. <laughs> Andrew, you wouldn't hit a man who weighed 130 pounds and was shorter than you would, would you? Yeah, I'd enjoy hitting a man shorter than I am. All right, then you and Amos fight. I'm going to get out here. Come here, come here. Listen, Kingfish, look at him. Oh, now. listen, boy, look here. There ain't no time to fight. Uh, whoever owns that car ought to go to the police and explain the thing. Yeah, well, why don't you take his advice, Andy? Amos is trying to help you. Now, listen here, Kingfish. And believe me, you is the owner of the car. Hey, is that right, Anna? I don't know, Amos. I just signed a radioactive contract. <laughs> I put my John Hamhock on it and everything else. All I know is, boys, that whoever owns that car better go to the police and get the thing straightened out, or there's going to be real trouble. So long, fellas. Is that Amos? Go to the police. Why do he always want to do things in a roundabout way? Ask me that. Kingfish, now, about me being revolved in this thing. Now, don't try to back out of it, Andy. You was already signed the contract. On top of that, you was revolved in another way. You remember about two weeks ago, you was with me when I bought them seat covers for the car? Yeah, well, what about it? Well, you saw me buy the material, didn't you? Yeah. There you was. You were the material witness. <laughs> Kingfish. Oh, not only that, but you was with me when I bought the horn for the car, so you was a sufferer, too. <laughs> and you was in this thing a half a dozen different ways. Mm, uh, you know, Kingfish, I can get in more trouble doing nothing than anybody I know. <laughs> oh, don't worry, Andy, old pal. I'm going to stand by in your time of need. That's the stuff. Now you're talking. What can I do to get out of this mess? Well, Andy, uh, i kind of been mulling over the thing for a while. I've been talking. You know, I think I've done mulling myself up angle here. Good. Well, yeah, if the police is looking for a light blue car, why don't we paint the thing some other color? Yeah, yeah, you got something there, King. Yeah. Then the police can never catch up with us. What color do you think we ought to paint it? Well, we don't want to paint it no color that's going to attract attention. No. We want to use something that ain't conspicuous, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, we'll paint it that dark red color that, uh, uh, what they call it? Oh, that's a great color. It's called macaroon. Yeah, let's... <laughs> He showed on a nice paint job on that car. Look at that. You don't look bad standing there at the curb, do it? No, no, that's a nice shade of macaroon, all right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the police ain't never going to come after us now, is they? Oh, no, they're looking for a blue car, you see. Uh, we got a red one there. We is in the clear already. Oh, yeah. We... Holy mackerel. Well, what's the matter, Anna? Look who's riding down the street here on one of them new two-seater tandem bicycles. Hmm. Shorty the barber. Now I have seen everything. Well, hello there, Shorty. Well, I'll be down, down for the imagine. I never expected to see. I, 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 Shorty, that uh, tandem bicycle you got there, that is really tough. Oh, me. yeah, yeah. Me, me and my dad have been having nice rides here, uh, whizzing around cars and everything. Oh, by the way, fellas, I'd like you to meet my dad. Uh, come in with to do this. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to get to you. How do I... Wait! Yeah, you must have uh, lost her off of there someplace, Shorty. Yeah, well, that's life. Uh, uh, say, Kingfish, uh, didn't this car of yours used to be light blue? How come you painted it? Well, now, look, Shorty, keep your big mouth closed about this, but somebody used this car in the jewelry store robbery. Is that car, Kingfish? That's right. Yeah, well, then, so you fellas is in awful trouble. Well, what you mean, Shorty? Well, now, this is a spring thing, fellas, but 
the janitor of the Lennon Farm apartment, and uh, he, he was up in my barber shop this morning. He, he was telling me that a woman that lives in apartment 622 in that building, she, she sees the robbery. You mean that a woman in apartment 622 sees the robbery, Jordan? Oh, yeah. <laughs> It seems that she managed to catch the last three numbers of the license plate, and she's decided to turn the information over to the police the first thing tomorrow morning. You know what that means, Ender? Yeah, I hope I get outside cell, that's all. <laughs> Jordy, tell me this. Who is this woman? Uh, you know anything about her? Well, all, all I know is that the janitor was telling me that she was always entering all kinds of contests to try, try, try to win prizes. And those contests try to win... Hey, wait a minute. You know, Ender? If we was to get this woman out of town, why, she couldn't go to the police some more. And I think that contest stuff give us the angle we need. Yeah, if she gives the police that license number, we're going to be in terrible trouble, you know that. Oh, uh, what you told you, don't be silly. Even if they put you in jail, they, 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 they couldn't keep you there. Oh, they couldn't, Jordan? No, no, you, 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 you could get a bail bond from... Uh, you, you, you could get out on a rid of uh, you, you, you could get out on a heavy... A couple of heavy... Uh, 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 Wanna buy a hot sauce? Friends, I wish Amos and Andy were on television tonight because I have here 12 beautiful Christmas cards that I wish all of you could see. They're really handsome, colorful cards, each a print of a winter scene by a famous American artist. Now, you'd say the set of 12 cards is a big dollar value, but here's a surprise. You can get them all for just 25 cents at a Rinso box top. Yes, 12 cards with envelopes for 25 cents and a Rinso box top. But you must hurry. There's only a limited supply. The address is Rinso Christmas Card Club, Box 30, New York 8. This offer is limited to the continental United States, Alaska, and Hawaii. Allow three weeks for delivery, but... Hurry, avoid the last-minute Christmas rush. Send 25 cents and a Rinso box top to Rinso Christmas Card Club, Box 30, New York 8. Do it today. Well, Andy, here's the woman's apartment, 622. Her name is Miss Higgins. Now, remember, the whole thing is to get her out of town. So that she can't give the cop that license number. Yeah, we're going to use that contest angle on her, huh? Yeah, that's it. Everybody in town has done entered that crystal crunchy contest. Yeah. And if she's crazy about contest, she certainly ought to be in that one. I'll ring the bell, you know. Okay. And I don't forget, I, the head of the company, and you as the chief contest judge. How do you do? Uh, madam, allow me to congratulate you. I am here to tell you that you are the winner of the crystal crunchy contest. Oh, you mean that I won the contest? Well, won't you come in? Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, now let's introduce ourselves. I am Mr. Crystal, president of the outfit. And our vice president, Mr. Crunchy, couldn't make it today. But uh, uh, this gentleman here is the judge of the limerick contest, the famous poet, Henry Wadsworth Brown. <laughs> a real poet? Oh, how charming. I've always wanted to be a real poet. Mm, likewise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is one of the top men in the racket. Yeah, he wrote some great poetry, Under the Village Smithy, Little <laughs> Peak, and all that stuff. Uh, say something to the lady in poetry, Wadsworth. Uh, uh, roses is red, violets is blue. I is happy to meet up with you. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 word of Jim, he's a genius. Oh, you? tell me, I'm so excited about winning the contest. Which one of my memories won it? Uh, which one, you say? Yes, I sent him three. Uh, well, I tell you, miss, all three of them won. You won win, play, and show, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you won the contest right across the board. Yeah. Oh, this is so exciting! Winning the contest. Mm -hmm. Now, when do I get the ten thousand dollars? Well, we brought the set. We brought the. We, we brought. Uh, well, you see, that is uh, uh, ten thousand dollars. Uh, well, don't stand there, watch. Well, say something. Uh, roses is red. Fire. <laughs> Excuse me for protruding, Miss, but you said something about the... Uh, it said in the paper the first prize was $10,000. Now, well, Miss, uh, I guess you read the rules of the contest, but you ain't read them careful enough. You said the first prize was $10,000 or a trip to Boston. Now, you was done one to all part of the contest. <laughs> but I don't want to go to Boston. 
Would you care to try for Cincinnati? I don't want to go no place. I just want to get my money. Well, now, look here, Miss. Uh, don't be a sore winner. I hear your ticket to Boston. The train leaves at 9 15, and you'll have to hurry. Well, I guess I ought to get something out of this contest, and I do have some friends I could stay with. Well, here's the ticket. Hope you have a nice trip. Oh, yeah, this is the best time to see Boston right now, right away. Well, I'll get packed now, but I wish I wasn't leaving till tomorrow morning. I was going someplace with my sister in the morning. Your sister? Yes, yeah, she saw Roger, and she's going to the police station to give them the license <laughs> number. Uh, give me back that ticket, lady. Uh, Wadsworth, you better take another look at them limericks, yeah. you know. So long, lady. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Roses is red, violets is red. <laughs> the thing didn't work, and I think we are through. Yeah. Andy, when the police gets our license number tomorrow morning, we're really going to be in trouble. Oh, yeah, I was really getting scared, Kingfish. Hey, look who coming into the drugstore there. Yeah, he got a briefcase under his arm. Uh, yeah, the Calhoun, the politician. Come on, I hear you. Hello there, boys. I ain't seen you in a long time. <laughs> hey, Calhoun, we is in trouble. Uh, could we retain you as a lawyer to defend us? I'm sorry, I'm moving right along. We need your help. Sorry, I'm moving right along. We got $10 in cash. I just come to a full stop. <laughs> Listen, here's the thing, Mr. Calhoun. The car we got was using that big jewelry store robbery, and the police got your license number. Well, the thing for you to do with is switch license plate. Oh, yeah, yeah. You mean switch the front one to the back and the back one to the front? <laughs> Kingfish, I have yet a lame brain, but this friend here of yours has got a compound fracture. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, Andy, Calhoun has got a good idea there. Look here, I just remembered. Right after this last New Year's Day, one of the large brothers went to Florida... And left his car in my customer. Mm-hmm. He's in the lot in the back of the large hall there. Been sitting there since New Year's Day. Yeah. That we can take our place off, throw him away, and put his place on our car. Oh, yeah, they'll never catch us that way. Oh, this is big, Calhoun. But one thing, if the police do catch us, if you got any experience in defending these kind of cases? Experience? When one of my biggest cases, I defended a fellow that shot a man. Yeah, well, what happened with the thing? Nothing to it. I asked for a short trial, made a short speech to the jury, and asked the judge for a short sentence. Well, how did your client come out? On a long rope. <laughs> well, Kingfish, we sure got out of that mess all right. Yeah, Andy, with them license plates from that other car on here, we ain't got nothing to worry about now. Yeah, I'm breathing a lot easier now. Yeah, yeah, and you know something? My car never runs better than had the motor tuned up and everything. Wait a minute, your car? Kingfish, ain't you got the future tense messed up with the past popsicle or something? Hey, what do you mean, Andy? Well, after all, Kingfish, I don't sign a contract saying you give me this thing. And look, I don't mean meaning to, meaning to explain this to you. That that contract was on the basis of a quick-term option, and your franchise on first five. You ain't got no more right to this thing, huh? Oh, wait a minute here. This is the dirtiest trick you done ever pulled Well, on. you are through with your car. It belongs oh, to me. Oh, wait a minute. I don't never want to have nothing to do with you again. Stop this car and let me get out of here. Well, all right. If that's the way you feel about it, it's all right with me. I'll stop the car. All right. Now, get out of here. Wrong, you big bum. I never want to speak to you again. Yeah, go ahead. That boy sure is a store here. Ain't no sense in trying to be nice to nobody. That's the way I figure it. Man. Oh, oh, what is this? What is this to here? All right, buddy, get your hands up there. I don't find anything funny. Well, now, wait a minute, officer. You, you, you got the wrong man. I didn't have nothing to do with that jewelry store robbery. <laughs> Jewelry store? We cleared up that case this morning. Well, then you don't, you won't be needing me then, huh? Oh, yes, we will. Those license plates identify you as the man who held up the United States Post Office last New Year's Day. Oh, wait, 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 wait. My wife says there's one thing all women agree on. Mm, yeah, well, I suppose I am kind of good looking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but well, what she meant was that they all agree about Rinso. More women use Rinso than any other wash day soap in the world. Rinso gets white clothes finer than new, washable colors brighter than new, because only Rinso contains sodium, 
Rinso is great for dishes, too. Rinso makes the hardest part of dishwashing easier. Pots and pans positively shine. Get the economical giant size Rinso right away. Stay tuned for the Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy program, which follows immediately over most of these stations. Good night, folks. See you next Sunday. your daily bath. Remember, there's not just one or two, but 13 areas of the skin where doctors have found B.O. Life Boy protects you all over. Gives you top 24 hours security. Get Life Boy right away. Be sure and listen to the Amos and Andy show at this same time next Sunday. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Your Beauty Hope and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> to most of us, a school dance isn't the most exciting event in the world, but to Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High, the one planned for last Friday night was a most welcome diversion. The more so since I was expecting bashful Mr. Boynton to peer out of his shell long enough to invite me to go with him. Anyway, last Friday morning, Mrs. Davis, my landlady, and I were discussing the dance at breakfast. Where did the funds come from for this dance, Connie? We're raising the money by means of a wishing well in front of the school. It's an idea of Harriet Conklin. Everybody's supposed to throw in a dime. You mean students and faculty members toss in dimes to pay for refreshments and things? That's right, Mrs. Davis. I tossed my dime into the well yesterday. And what did you wish, Connie? I wished it was only a nickel. <laughs> I had a very light lunch. If you want to know my real wish, though, you will have to keep it confidential. I won't breathe it to a living soul. R- word of honor? May I lose the top propeller on my beanie? <laughs> I wouldn't want you to get arrested for indecent exposure. <laughs> I wish that Mr. Boynton would pay more attention to me and less to that frog of his, McDougal. Why, Connie, don't tell me you're jealous of a frog. If it gets any worse, we'll both be the same color. <laughs> you ought to see the way he pampers that lumpy brute. He even took him to the movies last night. Said McDougal just loved the picture. <laughs> What did they see? What else? Hop along, Cassidy. <laughs> I think you're exaggerating, Connie. Mr. Boynton is very fond of you. Oh, that must be Walter Denton. He's taking me to school this morning. Just a minute, Walter. Excuse me, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Walter. Come in. Wait. Let me look at your hair, Miss Brooks. What? Poised in the doorway as you are, the sun seems to strike sparks from your already molten tresses. Well, don't stand there. Stamp me out. (laughs) Please come in before the flies do. I just got to run a comb through my blazing tresses, and we're off, Walter. Would you care for a glass of milk? I just had breakfast an hour ago, but I could always have a glass of milk and an egg sandwich. Oh, I forgot. You have breakfast ahead of your tapeworm. Walter, can I fix something for you? Oh, just anything you have in the house will be fine, Mrs. Davis. He means just everything you have in the house will be fine. (laughs) Give him a quick egg sandwich and some milk. Very well. I'll be back in a jiffy, Walter. Okay, Mrs. D. Miss Brooks, don't you think it was a wonderful idea of Harriet's to start the wishing well dance? I'll let you know after the dance. How's the well coming, by the way? Raising expenses? The dimes are flocking in. I was in charge of it for a while yesterday. Some of the wishes were a scream, Miss Brooks. Especially the ones that the faculty wished about Mr. Conklin. Our beloved principal? I never thought he was so popular with his staff. One after another, they all wish that he would get everything that's coming to him. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Now, you excuse me, Walter. I'm going to get my hat and purse. Oh, sure, Miss Brooks. Take your time. We're early. Here you are, Walter. Oh, just one egg sandwich, huh? Uh, That'll be all right. Oh, this is me. If you'll just sit real close to me here, i got a big favor to ask. A favor? Shh, shh. It's extremely confidential. I won't breathe a word of it. Word of honor? May I lose my beanie in the downdraft. <laughs> 
<laughs> What's the fever? Well, the other day at the wishing well, right after I wheedled a dime out of Mr. Boynton, Harriet wheedled his wish out of him. What did he wish for, Walter? He wished for a lock of Miss Brooks' hair. Oh, isn't that romantic? <laughs> but why doesn't he just ask her for it? Because he's too bashful. He says that's much too personal. But even though Harriet and I promised on our honor not to mention it to Miss Brooks, we've decided that our first step is to get him what he wants. When Miss Brooks finds out he's got it, and we'll see she does find out, then we'll take our next step, okay? Okay. But what's our first step again? Oh, please, there's no time for details. Me, Harriet, and my pal Stretch all have scissors. But just in case we don't get the opportunity, we want you to take a whack at it, too. Now, all you have to do is get her to focus her attention on something else and then snip off a hunk from the back. Say your time, Mrs. Davis, please. But when, Walter? Well, right now's a good time. Why, she's currying herself. <laughs> well... Oh, go ahead, Mrs. Davis. Here's the scissors. Just don't let her catch you, whatever you do. All right, Walter. If it's to further her romance, I guess it's worth a try. Oh, Connie. Yes, Mrs. Davis? Anything I can do to help? No, thank you. Just putting my hat on. Oh, uh, oh uh, just a minute, Connie. Turn around a second. Just as I thought. What? There's a bug on the back of your dress. A bug? Where? Get him off. It's just a ladybug, Connie. Lady or gentleman, get him off. <laughs> All right. Now hold still. There. She's gone. Thanks. Mrs. Davis, are you sure that was just a ladybug? Positive, dear. Why do you ask? Because just before you flipped it off, I could swear she snapped at me. <laughs> well, here we are, Miss Brooks, ten minutes ahead of time. Thanks, Walter. I'm glad we're a little early. Gives me a chance to expose myself to Mr. Boynton's incipient invitation to the dance. Incipient? He's been threatening to ask me, I like to think. Oh, he'll ask you, all right. He's intensely interested in you, Miss Brooks. I can tell by the way he looks at you. Oh, you can. Well, have you ever seen him look at McDougal? <laughs> oh, sure, but believe me, they're two different looks. I know. One is up and one is down. <laughs> well, I'd better be getting out now. Oh, just a minute, Miss Brooks. Uh, there's something on your collar. On my collar? Is it a ladybug? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Here, let me brush it off for you. Uh, turn around. She must have come with a suit. <laughs> All right, Walter. <laughs> There's one thing I'm sorry for. It's the ladybug with a cold. Oh, no. No, that was me, Miss Brooks. No, I had to cover up the... Well, that is, I should have covered up warmer in bed last night. Well, I'll find a place to park and see you in school. All right, Walter. Happy parking. Thanks, Miss Brooks. And a happy Mr. Boynton to you. Good morning, Mr. Boynton. May I come in? Oh, oh, Miss Brooks, of course. Good morning. I was just straightening out McDougal's cage. Naturally. Uh, it's Miss Brooks, Mac. Say hello. Boom. <laughs> Hi, Mac. <laughs> hey, he sounds a little dejected, doesn't he? Oh, yes, he hasn't been sleeping well at all. Just tosses and turns all night long. So do I. <laughs> But you don't bruise your sides against wire mesh when you toss around. Now, if he doesn't improve today, I'm afraid I won't be able to ask you to go to the student faculty dance tonight, Miss Brooks. Were you going to, Mr. Boynton? Mm. You get your own date. <laughs> uh, were you, Mr. Boynton? Well, yes, I was, but Mac here... I'm getting a little tired of Mac here, Mr. Boynton. Every time we have a date, something happens to Mac. Last Monday, I had to eat lunch alone because he had laryngitis and you wanted to massage his throat. Well, it did him a world of good, didn't it, Mac? <laughs> another Nelson Eddy, Mac. Now shut up. And Wednesday afternoon, when we were supposed to go for a walk in the park, you called to cancel that date. Well, I had to. Mac had a headache. Oh, great. A frog with a headache. <laughs> I can't say I like your attitude, Miss Brooks. If you knew the slightest bit about cellular structure, you'd be aware of the fact that amphibians and humans are equally susceptible to cranial pain. Why, post-orbital pressure on a squamosal at the base of a frog's skull can be most distressing. Now, ain't that a shame? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. And if you think I'm going to a dance while McDougal's squamosal is irritated, you're mistaken. <laughs> Excuse me now, I've... 
Yes, I've got to go to the cafeteria. I'm feeding a little lettuce for him. Maybe I can help you. I'd make it hot for him. No, you just keep him company till I return. Well, here we are alone, Mac. Ooh. No, don't worry. I'm not going to do anything to you. But just between you and me, Mac, Ooh. you're nothing but a big pain in the squamosal. <laughs> Starring Eve Arden will continue in just a moment, but first, here is Vern Smith. For bare skin beauty, it's bath size palm olive with its famous beauty lather. Yes, bath size palm olive for loveliness all over. There's something thrillingly new in this wonderful beauty lather of bath size palm olive soap. New fragrance, new charm, new allure. See if palm olive in your daily tub or shower doesn't leave your shoulders, arms, and back, yes, all of you softer and smoother. Completely lovelier all over. You're thrilled to the tender whisper of perfume it leaves on your skin. A whisper that says, come hither to romance. And this new bath size palm olive is so big, so thrifty, economical to use because it lasts so long and gives so much soft, lovely lather so fast. That soft, lovely lather with its alluring new fragrance is palm olive soaps alone. Palm olive's famous beauty lather. Yes, a new fragrance, new charm, new allure that can make every woman a vision of delight in the new revealing fashion that shows so much more of you. So remember, for bare skin beauty, it's bath size palm olive with its famous beauty lather. Yes, bath size palm olive for loveliness all over. Get bath size palm olive soap tomorrow. Men folk love it too. <laughs> my first two morning classes, I had a little free time, which I was determined to employ in a really constructive manner. So I hastened to my desk and promptly did some first-rate brooding. It wasn't long, however, before my rancid reverie was interrupted. Stretch Snodgrass, Madison's star athlete, paid me a little visit. Although Stretch is splendidly equipped physically, mentally he doesn't go along with a gag. <laughs> Anyhow, while I sat with my head in my hands, muttering voodoo curses against my arch-rival, McDougal, Stretch slipped into my room, tiptoed up to my desk, and murmured, Hi, Miss Brooks. Can I see you for a minute? Please, Stretch. May I see you for a minute? Gosh, Miss Brooks, you don't need no permission to see me. I'm just a student. <laughs> I sometimes wonder of what. <laughs> sit down, Stretch. What can I do for you? Well, first of all, you can stop Snag Mulligan from calling me names in class. Names? Yeah. He says stretch don't describe me good enough. He's telling everybody to call me Sano. Sano? Well, they're the cigarettes with the nicotine removed. Oh, well, what has that got to do with you? He says I'm the schoolboy with the brain removed. <laughs> Where did he get a hold of your x-rays? Uh, I'll tell him to cut it out. Now, what else can I do for you? Nothing, Miss Brooks. But I was thinking, maybe there's something I can do for you. For me? But Stretch, nobody calls me names. In fact, nobody calls me at all lately. It's about the dance, Miss Brooks. The wishing well dance. It's for faculty and students, isn't it? Yes. Well, I realize that, I mean, when it comes to romantic stuff and things like that, I'm no Mr. Boynton. Neither is he. <laughs> what I'm trying to say, Miss Brooks, is, well, have you been spoken for yet? Not exactly, Stretch. That is, I was just about to be spoken for when I was croaked at. You mean Mr. Boynton's not taking you? Not so far. Then I would consider it a very high-type honor if you could see your way clear to escorting me to the dance. <laughs> Why, Stretch, how chivalrous. Now, please don't go getting any wrong ideas, Miss Brooks. That is, I don't think a person should be led on, do you? Definitely not. Then you'll understand when I tell you right out. I'm not in love with you, Miss Brooks. <laughs> That's what I like, a nice clean break. <laughs> no sense in dragging these things out. Oh, it isn't that I'm not terribly fond of you. It's just that, well, there's a difference in our ages. Oh, I know, Stretch. I'm old enough to be your cousin. <laughs> well, you don't have to give me your final answer about the dance until later, Miss Brooks. After all, I think Mr. Point ought to get another crack at you. <laughs> He's really gone on you. Well, it's taking him too long to get back. 
No, Stretch, I'm a little tired of playing second fiddle to a frog. I may not go to the dance at all. Gee, I'm sorry you feel that way, Miss Brooks. But I'll check back with you after school. Oh, before I go, would you mind turning your head toward the window? I, I think there's something on your back. On my back? It's not that ladybug again. Ladybug? Oh, yeah, that's just what it is. Well, hold still now, and I'll brush it off. There, all gone. Oh, there's one more thing. I had some kind of a message for you. It's been bothering me all morning. Oh, yeah, Mr. Conklin wants to see you in his office. Mr. Conklin? When did he give you that message, Stretch? This morning on the way into school. This morning? Well, what time did he say he wanted to see me? He said immediately. But it's too late for that now, so you might as well take your time. <laughs> so long, Sano. <laughs> Hi ho, hi ho, as off my nut I go. I wish that I oh. oh, I'm sorry, Miss Brooks, I didn't see you. Thanks, Harriet. I have been losing weight lately. I was just going in to see your father. Is Madison's esteemed principal in a good mood? Wonderful. For Dad. I just bought him the receipts from the wishing well, Miss Brooks. That's what he wants to see you about. He's got a surprise for you. A surprise? What is it? It wouldn't be a surprise anymore if I told you. But Miss Brooks. Before you go in to see Daddy, there's somebody else wants to see you. Somebody you'd rather see than Daddy, I know. That could be anybody, Harriet. <laughs> Please be more specific. It's Mr. Boynton. He told me to tell you to drop into his lab as soon as you got the time. When did he tell you that, Harriet? Oh, hours ago. The Pony Express was faster than you, kid. <laughs> oh, just a minute, Miss Brooks. Before you go, you better turn around a minute. There's something on your collar. You, too? Well, what is it, Harriet? Oh, I'll get it off for you. It's, uh... It's a small piece of yarn. Now, isn't that sweet? My ladybug must be knitting me some socks. Oh, thanks very much, Mr. Jensen. These scissors will certainly come in handy. I beg your pardon, Mr. Boynton, but these scissors won't come in at all. They may be brought in, but they most certainly will not come in. <laughs> You said, these scissors will certainly come in handy. Then I said, they may be brought in, but they most certainly will not come in. And I meant just that. <laughs> you see, ever since I've been custodian here at Madison, I've tried to get people to eliminate meaningless phrases from their conversation. Now, I know you have, Mr. Jensen, When Gessner, you but... say the scissors will come in, you are attributing a mobility to an object which has none. Now, tell the truth, Mr. Boynton. Have you ever seen scissors coming into a place under their own power? I haven't, Mr. Jensen. But if you don't mind, I'm expecting somebody. Even if I did mind, you'd still be expecting them, wouldn't you? Well, of course you would. But if you'll pardon my curiosity, Mr. Boynton, why did you want these scissors? Well, it's rather a personal reason, Mr. Jensen, but no, I don't mind telling you. I've wanted a lock of someone's hair for quite a while now, and I've finally mustered enough courage to try to get it. Oh, isn't that romantic? <laughs> Who is the hair E, Mr. Boynton? <laughs> that is, uh, whose lock of hair do you want? Uh, it's Miss Brooks, between you and me. That would be a little crowded for her, <laughs> If you do want a lot of her hair, I certainly, I certainly wish you good luck. I, I have to be going now. I, I hope I haven't offended you by indulging in my little hobby. Not at all, Mr. Jensen. And about those scissors coming in handy, I get your point. Say, I get your point about the scissors. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? No, not very. <laughs> Well, hello, Mr. Jensen. How are things? What things? <laughs> I don't know. Everything. You've got a new baby at home, haven't you? Yes, Miss Brooks. One new one and five used ones. <laughs> Six children. Just think of it. It's hard not to. <laughs> How's the latest? Is he big? Reasonably large, yes. Have you named him yet? Yes, we've named him. What did you call him, Mr. Jensen? No, we didn't call him Mr. Jensen. That's my name. <laughs> there must be another route to the laboratory. <laughs> you have a new baby, Mr. Jensen. What is his name? His name is Lucy. <laughs> 
Right, well, if you'll excuse me, Miss Brooks, I'll be running along. Oh, now I've caught you, Mr. Jensen. You won't actually be running along at all. Oh, yes, I will. Goodbye, Miss Brooks. <laughs> well, some days you just can't win. Uh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Boynton. What did you do? Oh, now, don't you start that. <laughs> Harriet told me you wanted to see me. Oh, I do, Miss Brooks. It's about this morning. I didn't like the way we parted. Oh, neither did I, Mr. Boynton, but you had to get some hot lettuce for the king of the croakers. <laughs> well, please, Miss Brooks, don't be angry. That's all over now, and Max, feel, Max feels much better. In fact, if he keeps on improving today, I'd very much like to take you to the wishing well dance tonight. You would, Mr. Boynton? Yes, indeed. And there's something else I'd like to do, too. Right now. There is? Yes, there is. Would you turn your head a bit, please? Like this? Uh, no, not up toward me. Away from me. <laughs> In fact, you better turn all the way around. But why, Mr. Boynton? Uh, there's something on the collar of your suit. It's probably just a loose thread. Here, I'll snip it off for you. There. Is that all, Mr. Boynton? Uh, yes, of course, that's all. Then I guess I'll be running over to Mr. Conklin's office for some warmth and affection. Oh, just a minute, Miss Brooks. You won't actually be running Oh, over. yes, I will. Goodbye, Mr. Boynton. Excuse me, Mr. Conklin, but I got a message that you wanted to see me. Uh, how was it delivered? By pack mule? <laughs> Oh, never mind, Miss Brooks. There's no time for apologies. I've been considering various members of the faculty for the position of executive hostess at the Wishing Well Dance tonight. Yes, Mr. Conklin? Your name was the first to pop into my mind. And as quickly as I could, I popped it out. <laughs> However, due to severe pressure from my wife and daughter, I hereby appoint you Miss Wishing Well of 1949. You think I'm deep enough? <laughs> Thanks very much, Mr. Conklin. Uh, this is not merely an honorary title, Miss Brooks. I've invited several members of the Board of Education to attend. And it will be your duty to see that the entire affair is run off without a hitch. Well, I'll try my best, Mr. Conklin. Will I be in charge of purchasing refreshments? Uh, you will. Harriet will turn over the funds that were collected, and I suggest that you enlist the aid of one of the male members of the faculty to help carry the bundle. I have a biology teacher in the balcony, Doctor. That is, <laughs> I'm sure Mr. Boynton will be glad to help. Yes. That's the door. Yes, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Conklin. Goodbye, Miss... Oh, uh, just a moment, Miss Brooks. Come back to my desk, please. What is it, Mr. Conklin? I'd like to take a look at the back of your head. <laughs> just as I thought. Miss Brooks, you are hereby relieved of all duties at the dance tonight. But I don't understand, Mr. Conklin. Furthermore, I forbid you even to put in an appearance. But why? I told you the Board of Education would be there, Miss Brooks. And I flatly refuse to have them see one of my teachers... Wearing a butch haircut. And this is what makes the platypus unique. Well, that's all for today. Class dismissed. Excuse me, Mr. Boynton, but I've got something you wanted. Here. It's a lock of Miss Brooks' hair. A lock of Miss Brooks' hair. How did you know I wanted that? Harriet told me, but don't worry, Mr. Boynton. Your secret hasn't gone any further than Harriet and me. And Stretch and Mrs. Davis. Don't forget me. I'm in on it, too. Miss Brooks. Oh, we're cooked. Miss Brooks, I hardly know what to say. Well, I do. First of all, I'm quite flattered to learn that you want a lock of my hair. Secondly, I'm happy to find out why everybody's had me turning around like a whirling dervish all day. Mr. Boynton, you got a lock on my last pin, didn't you? Yes, I did, Miss Brooks. With the lock Walter's given you, you have two. Would you like to try for four? <laughs> Please, Miss Brooks. Go ahead. Take some more. I'll just tell people, a funny thing happened to me while I was bending over my mix master. <laughs> of course, if you'll just be patient, I'm sure some fresh returns will be coming in momentarily. <laughs> Why don't I get up? Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Well, I, I guess I'll be running along now. Open your fist, Stretch. You're taking all the curl out of my curl. She's wise to a stretch. Just hand it over. Yes, and don't rush off. We should be hearing from another hairy precinct any minute. Hello, Mr. Boynton. I'd like to give you this. Oh, hi, Miss Brooks. Well, goodbye, Mr. Boynton. Wait a minute, Harriet. Drop it in the collection plate and sit down. <laughs> she knows all about it, Harriet. But how did you find out, Miss Brooks? 
A little ladybug told me. <laughs> Look, Mr. Boyne, now that you have as much of my hair as I have, I think I'll buy you a family-sized locket in which to carry it. Well, I didn't want it to carry, Miss Brooks. You didn't? Then would you mind explaining, Mr. Boynton? It's rather embarrassing, Miss Brooks, but, well, you see, I've sewn together this piece of cheesecloth, and I figured if I could stuff it with some real fluffy hair, it'd make a nice pillow for McDougal's head. <laughs> McDougal's head? Well, it may help cure his insomnia. I was hoping you wouldn't mind, Miss Brooks. Why should I mind? He's been in my hair long enough. He might as well be on it. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only luster cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster cream, not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanent. Four-ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. Your coming glory to a lost cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Conklin relented and gave me permission to attend the dance, but not until I had repossessed my missing curls and stuck them back on with some scotch tape. <laughs> At any rate, Mr. Boynton seemed satisfied with my appearance. You look lovely, Miss Brooks. Something tells me we're going to have a, a wonderful time this evening. I hope so, Mr. Boynton. And I must admit that I'm very pleasantly surprised to find that you're not worrying about that frog of yours. Well, why should I worry about him, Miss Brooks? McDougal's fine. Now, how about this dance? I think they're going to play a waltz. Oh, I'd love it, Mr. Boynton. <laughs> <laughs> On second thought, you two go ahead. I'll cut in later. <laughs> Brought to you by Carmine Soap, Pure Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. <laughs> Here's good shaving news. Three men out of every four can get more comfortable, actually smoother shave, with Palmolive Brushless Shaving Cream. This is not just a claim. Here's the proof. 1,297 men tried the Palmolive brushless way to shave described on the tube. And no matter how they had shaved before, three men out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Try Palmolive brushless yourself. See if you don't get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves the proved Palmolive brushless way. This week in Chicago, there's a meeting of great interest to American Housewives, the Golden Jubilee Convention of the National Association of Retail Grocers. It's especially interesting because of the service and convenience rendered to women shoppers by these independent retail grocers in maintaining abundantly stocked shelves of carefully selected quality products so important to our homes. It's through the efforts of these grocers that you get what you want when you want it. The Colgate Palmolive Peat Company is proud to send greetings to these 10,000 independent retail grocers, your good neighbors and ours. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evening over most of these stations. Be with us next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. Stay tuned now for Life with Luigi, which follows over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Avalon cigarettes, please. Yes, sir. 
Just a moment, sir. Don't forget your change. You'd never guess, but Apollon cost you less. Oh, why not always travel on with Apollon? Good evening, friends. Good evening from the Auditorium Theater in Chicago, where we have as our guests for this evening's broadcast delegates to the American Legion Convention, their wives and friends. This is Del King saying welcome to Avalon Time with Kurt Massey, Edna Stilwell, Jeanette, the Avalon Chorus, Bob Strong and his orchestra, and radio's red-headed ragamuffin, Richard Red Skelton. Gentlemen, before you buy your next pack of cigarettes, think this over. Avalons offer you not just one advantage, but two all-important points of superiority. Reasons why it will pay you well to give them a trial. Yes, Avalons give you both quality, outstanding quality, mind you, and exceptional money-saving economy. They're union-made from a blend of the very finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos that money can buy. You couldn't get finer quality tobacco in any other cigarette, regardless of price, regardless of brand. And this superior Avalon quality is the reason why you'd never guess they cost you less. Three to five cents less per pack than other popular price brands. A repeated saving that turns into many, many extra dollars every year. Without a doubt, friends, Avalons are the outstanding cigarette value on the market today. The next time, give Avalon the trial. And now we bring you our streamlined gesture in his bit of repertorial rhetoric, Headline Hokum. Those timely topics of today, as transcribed, tortured, twisted, and told by that turbulent teletype tinkering Tyro, the Red Skelton. Thank you and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And now for the news from coast to coast. Cleveland, Ohio. A man escapes from a filling station without getting his windshield wiped. Chicago, Illinois. Forty-three refugees land in Chicago from Washington Park Racetrack. Decker, Indiana. A nearsighted farmer plowed up a railroad track. <laughs> I know how the poor guy feels. Last week, my nearsighted uncle took his tractor out and plowed under three good humor men. <laughs> Speaking of farmers, my uncle didn't do so well this year with his wheat, by the way. In fact, it was so short, they had to lather it before they could cut it. Hollywood, California. New picture, The Rain Came, has big premiere. California Chamber of Commerce says it's just propaganda. Mansfield, Ohio. A man escaped from an asylum, stole an automobile, and hit two Chinese laundrymen. Police report the accident caused by a loose nut and two washers. <laughs> News from the industrial world. Experts state that in 1941, everything will be streamlined. <laughs> I guess he hasn't seen my girl. <laughs> she couldn't possibly be in shape by 1941. <laughs> Don't kill them, they're hard enough to get. <clears throat> Fashion news for the women. Women this fall are going to wear silk stockings made out of coal. That's not silly. Can you imagine being dancing with some girl all of a sudden? She says, pardon me. <laughs> I think I have a run in my coal bin. <laughs> Chicago, Illinois. The American Legion Convention arrives in Chicago. Boy, and everybody's having a lot of fun here, too. My uncle Hody left his uh, left my aunt Elma home this year. She kind of got out of hand last year at the convention because all he did was run around out yelling, "Where's Alma?" Yeah. The <laughs> thanks a lot, both of it. The ah, oh, but you'd never recognize Michigan Boulevard. You remember it used to run north and south. 
They fix it. It's east and west now. <laughs> so far, only one member has got hurt. He opened up the windows on the 10th floor of his hotel, and he says, I think I'll fly around the block. <laughs> I'd have stopped him, but I thought he could make it. <laughs> there, was, there was a cowboy legionnaire from Texas. I'll never forget this as long as I live. He come running out of his hotel, he ran up to the curb and jumped about five feet in the air, and he landed flat on his back. <laughs> he got up and he turned around and he says, gee, I could have swore I bought my horse with me. Well, I guess that just about takes care of the news for tonight. So I'll step aside and let Jeanette sing, It Had to Be You. Sing it pretty, Jeanette, but pretty. <laughs> it had to be you. It had to be you. I wandered around and finally found the someone that who could make me be true, could make me be blue, and even be glad just to be sad, thinking of you, some others I'd see. Might never be me, might never be cross or try to be bald, but they wouldn't do for nobody else gave me a thrill with all your faults. I love you till it had to be you, had to be you, wonderful you. We don't have television, so you could see her. Brown hair, red lips, blue eyes, pink cheeks. In fact, she's a Technicolor knockout. <laughs> and the guy waving the baton, couldn't afford a flag, is uh, Bob Strong, the ex-Kansas hog caller. <laughs> no fooling. All he has to do is raise his voice, yell out, and a pig answers. <laughs> hey, scout! Yes, but... <laughs> uh. I see you have a new suit. Well, so what? Is it a crime to buy a new suit of clothes? It is the kind you buy. Yeah. Listen, this is a very special material in this suit. My tailor said it matched my personality. Oh, cheesecloth. Yeah. <laughs> this cloth, Bill, happens to be that new Chicago Cubs material. Genuine Gabby Dean. I got that suit with 57 wrappers of uh, gum wrappers. <laughs> I gummed that up, didn't I? Yeah. Well, I meant no offense, Fred. But anyway, I've got some real bad news for you. What is it, Dell? Don't tell me they found Daddy Warbuck's body. No, but you know that idea you had of starting a school for bathtub singers? Sure, it's a swell idea. I'm really going to start a school for bathtub singers. Sort of a Saturday night school. <laughs> After all, I'm one of the original bathtub baritones. Of course, I'm a little out of practice. You mean you haven't been singing? He hasn't been bathing. Yeah. <laughs> on this program, they used to enter on cues. Now they enter on insults. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, look, Ed. Now, I'm doing the starting... Oh, come in. Uh, pardon me, buddy. Uh, I am Elmer Droop. Do you think you could fix me up with a short one before the dance starts? Oh, a short one, huh? Well, right across the street to Maury's place. Uh, right across... Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Uh, well, as I was saying... Who was that, anyhow? <laughs> as I was saying, I'm starting a special post bathtub thing. It's for the American Legion. I'm going to call it the Saturday Evening Post. <laughs> I got the whole idea from my uncle. Your uncle? Mm. He hasn't had any use for his bathtub since Prohibition. Yeah. <laughs> That's so. Well, he must spend a lot of time in the tub. 
Everybody I know called him an old soak. <laughs> well, Red, how'd he give you the idea of starting the bathtub singing school? Well, one day he went into the bathroom, and without thinking what he was doing, he got into the tub. <laughs> Oh, I know. That must have been the day he apologized for reeking with the smell of water. Mm. Oh, it couldn't have been, no. Well, anyway, your Saturday night bathtub singing school is doomed. What do you mean? The sponsors are moving the show to Wednesday night starting next week. Oh, oh so that's what Mr. Avalon meant at rehearsal when he said he was going to kick me into the middle of next week. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, Red, but the show moves to Wednesday night starting next Wednesday, September 27th. Same time, same station. Same joke. Yeah. Now, listen. <laughs> they can't do this to me. What? Come in. Oh, oh pardon. pardon me, buddy, but I got to get fixed up with a short one before the dance starts. Well, that's funny. Maury couldn't fix you up with a short one. Try the place around the corner. Uh, run, uh, thanks, buddy. Uh, this time, don't drag your heels on the way out. Boy, now there's a guy that's really having fun. <laughs> My oldest brother's having a lot of fun, too. He's meeting all of his old pals here. Everybody calls him Sam Brown. Sam Brown? Yeah, he's taking a belt to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> that should have been the other way around, but I'm not going back. <laughs> but about this Saturday night bathtub singing, hey, maybe I could get the people to change their bath night. Or maybe I could change Saturday up to Wednesday. Who do you think you are, the president? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, too bad it's not on Thursday night. That's the maid's night out, and people could save a lot of time by taking the dishes in the tub with them. <laughs> Gosh, and I've, I've even sent for a, a real sailor to be the admiral of the toy sailboats as people float in their tubs. Now I'm in a pickle. Hello, sweet Linus. Well, look who's in town. Gypsy Rose Levy. <laughs> Please, around the convention, I'm being known as Mademoiselle Ginsburg from Amontiers, Indiana. Later tonight, I'm doing a revival of a play I used to do for the dope boys over there. Oh, how they love me in that musical, Camille. Camille? Camille's not a musical. So on stage, I can't whistle a little? <laughs> Never would I forget the scene where I'm dying. <laughs> All the while, I'm dying such tears with weeping from the dope boys. And finally, when I die, such applause. <laughs> oh, well, you probably want me for support, huh? That's right, Lokshin Kugel. <laughs> Could you lend me, please, five bucks? Oh, uh, some other time, Gypsy. Right now, I'm very busy. My, my, such a stingy pants. <laughs> Money with him is no object, just an objection. <laughs> well, now to get back to my bathtub singing school. I... That must be the sailor. Come in. Hercules, a seagull. Oh, yes, Mr. Skelton, and it's just gobs of fun. <laughs> gobs of fun. <laughs> Looks like we're getting a little corn off of the cob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I missed that one too tonight. <laughs> Say, how come you're a sailor, Herky? Well, you see, my girl likes football, and this is the only way I could think of to get tickets to the Army-Navy game. Your girl? Say, uh, you probably got a girl in every port. Who oh, heavens, do you think so? <laughs> oh, I'm going to have an awful battle with my conscience, then. Ah, don't worry, Archie. I'll tell you how, I'll tell you what to do to strengthen your will. Strengthen it? Well, good heavens, I want something to weaken it. <laughs> Imagine you a sailor. I bet you can't even handle yourself in water. Oh, can I? <laughs> well, once when I was ten miles offshore and the boat started to sink... I dove overboard and reached land in one minute. Reached land in one minute? Impossible. Not for me, it's not. I can't swim, so I sunk. <laughs> well, I gotta go now, Mr. Skelton. If I get my sailor suit all dirty, my mom will wallop the tar out of me. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Herky. I need you as the head skipper of my toy boat. Now, your slogan will be, rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, three men in a tub. Oh, mercy, how unsanitary. <laughs> Well, I don't care. You wait. Next Wednesday, Dell, I'll have everybody... Come in. Uh, look, buddy, I couldn't get a short one in the last place either. And I've got to get a short one before the dance starts. Well, I can't help you out then, Drew. But uh, why not? Look at them girls out there. I'm looking for a date, and I'm such a little runt. 
I got to get a short one before the dance starts. Yeah. Oh, what do you play some music, Bob? <laughs> Here's Bob Strong and his orchestra in Bob's own arrangement of Day In, Day Out. said about Avalon cigarettes? Well, he said, well, blow down me topsails and shiver me timbers if these Avalons ain't the best cigarettes I ever smoked. Aye, it's been clear sailing in me pocketbooks took on a cargo of extra shekels since I signed up with Avalons. <laughs> the old captain is right, friends, and your pocketbook will take on many, many extra dollars, too, when you switch to Avalon. You see, Avalons cost three to five cents less per pack than other popular price brands. And you'll be amazed how fast that saving of three to five cents on every pack of cigarettes you smoke turns into important money, extra dollars that you never would have otherwise. But bear this in mind, friends. Without knowing it, you'd never guess Avalon's cost you less. They're unsurpassed in quality, union-made from the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos that grow, blended to perfection. What more could you ask in a cigarette? Exceptionally high quality, outstanding money saving economy. Avalon certainly deserve a trial. Get a pack tonight. <laughs> Kurt Massey and the Avalon chorus in that melody which led the parade of American hits for so long, Harbor Life. One evening long ago, a big ship was leaving. One evening long ago, two lovers were grieving. A crimson sun went down, the lights began to glow. Across the harbor, one evening long ago, I saw the harbor line. They only told me we were part. Once brought you to me. Brought you to me. I watched the harbor light. How could I help if tears were starting? Goodbye to tender night. Beside the silvery sea. Silvery sea. I long to hold. Just once more But you were on the ship And I was on the shore Now I no lonely night For all the while my heart is with Some other heart
And now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to our slice of life, a short playlet on things that happen in everyday life, things that you do, I do, in fact, everybody does. What's the one about tonight, Red? Well, it's about a fellow who wants a raise in salary, but he hasn't the nerve to ask for it, and no crack. <laughs> Well, anyway, this fellow wants a raise in salary, but he doesn't think the time's right because he's only been with the firm for five years. <laughs> <laughs> you set the scene, Dell. All right, Red. The time about 8 o'clock in the morning. The place somewhere in your hometown. Now, as the scene opens, we find Edna Stilwell, who plays the part of a stenographer, greeting Red Skelton, who plays the part of an almost white-collar man. <laughs> Skelton, is five... Skelton is five minutes late for work. Listen. Well, look who's here. Isn't it a lovely morning? You mean the boss isn't here yet? No. Nope. I think he's still down in the bar having a nightcap. Oh. Did you punch the time clock this morning? No, I'm so weak. I just slapped it. <laughs> Didn't you go to bed last night? Look at your face. Well, if it's the same one I had last night, I've seen it. <laughs> Besides, I got up so late this morning, I had to shave on the bus. Well, you better get more sleep. Hmm. Well, I'd like to, but my little brother keeps me awake all night long. He's a messenger boy, you know, and all night he dreams he's riding a bicycle. Gee, the only time I get any rest at all is when he's coasting. <laughs> you look rested today, though. Thanks. Hmm. I think my vacation did me good. Did you have a good time? Oh, I had more fun. You did? I went to a summer place called Camp Termites in the woods. Hmm. And everyone was so friendly. Yeah. Yes, and at night when you'd go to bed, the mosquitoes would come around and tuck you in. Mm. Gee, I wish I could save enough money to go up to the mountains, or even up in the hills. Gee, the nearest thing I ever get to anything that's silly is the lumps in my mashed potatoes. What did you do on your vacation? My vacation? You mean the time the boss gave me a long lunch hour? Yes. Well, I took a boat ride on those excursion boats, the S.S. Icky. <laughs> Oh, it was a nice boat. It had a crew, a crew of three. Sort of a S.S. Icky with a one, two, three. <laughs> uh, and the captain, I had a lot of fun. The captain let me steer the boat, you know. And it's the first time a boat ever crossed Lake Michigan side saddle. <laughs> I love to take boat trips. I'll well, take a boat someday. maybe with your raise and sour, you can save enough to take a cruise to Bermuda next year. Well, I want to tell you now, about that raise. Now, don't tell didn't... me. You didn't ask for it. Well, I didn't want to start any trouble. Besides, I've only got 40 years to go, and then I get my pension. <laughs> and I... You remember what I told you? Remember? I said if you didn't ask for that raise, I wouldn't be your girl any longer. Oh, don't say that. Well, you know I couldn't live without you and your mother's cooking. <laughs> and besides, if I ask for a raise, I'm afraid he'll fire me. Well, suppose he does. You could get another job. How? I don't even know Jim Farley. <laughs> Besides, I don't want to take any chances. My mom needs the money when they're running. Why don't your stepfather go to work? I think he's going to go to work next week. In fact, he's so sure of getting a job, he's already planning a walkout. He wouldn't stand on his feet long enough for that. Yeah. Now, listen. Lazy. Someday we're going to get married. We are? Yes, but not until you learn to ask for things. Oh. Now, when Mr. Cheatham comes in, you're going to walk in the office, look him straight in the eye... And what are you going to say? Well... Tell me, what are you going to say? You want the inkwell spill, Mr. Cheatham? <laughs> no. You're going to say, listen, Mr. Cheatham, I've worked for you for five years, and I want more money. That's what you're going to say. I am? Gee, I'm a real he-man, ain't I? <laughs> hmm? Shh. There, it's him now. Good morning, Mr. Cheatham. Uh, uh, nice morning, Mr. Cheatham. Skelton. How come every time I walk into this office, you're not working? How come? Well, I guess I just haven't been listening lately. Good morning, Mr. Cheatham. Oh, yes. Good morning, Miss Stilwell. Oh, by the way, call up my broker and tell him to buy me 10,000 shares of Peruvian steel at $2. Yes, sir. It's a steal at that price. <laughs> it's oh, a Mr. steal. Cheatham. Get it? Steal. You're so clever at making up witty things. Isn't he, Richard? <laughs> yeah. Well, stop laughing on my time. Yeah. And, Miss Stilwell, if anyone wants me, I'm in conference. And, oh, uh, has Dick Tracy, I mean, has the morning paper come yet? No, sir, but I'll send it as I did as soon as it does. All right. He's awful gruff, isn't he? 
Oh, now calm yourself. Mr. Keaton's a very nice boss. Yeah. And now would be a good time to ask for that raise. Yeah. Oh, if you'd only get enough nerve to assert yourself. Well, if you really feel that way about it, I'll ask you. Some of these days. Mm. Well, I'm not going to bother with you anymore. Don't speak to me until you go into Mr. Cheatham's office and ask for a raise. Oh, gee, Edna, you're going to get me fired. Can I ask him tomorrow? Oh, don't get mad at me. Well, if you don't pay any attention to me and I go in there and get fired, then I won't be able to pay any attention to you. Or vice versa. <laughs> gee, I feel a little sick. All right, I'll do it. But I got an awful feeling this is the end. Why, he's really going to do it. Well, what are you putting your hat and coat on for? I asked for the raise like you said, and I got fired like I said. Goodbye. off another Saturday night spot. Yes, sir, Red. In fact, that cleans up the last Saturday night spot for us. It's Wednesday night from now on, you know, at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time and 7.30 Central Standard Time. Yes, and we'll try to give everybody a good time. And before signing off, I'd like to say to the boys of the American Legion, we hope that you have a lot of fun and the finest convention that you've ever had, and we know you will. Good night, everybody, and we'll see you all next Wednesday night. Don't forget... Remember, friends, during the week when you ask for Avalon cigarettes... Don't forget your change. So why not always travel on with Avalon? Yes, you'd never guess, but Avalon's cost only ten cents, plus city or state tax. Be with us next Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time when the Brown and Williamson Tobacco Corporation will again present Avalon Time. Starting a new series of programs with us, we'll have Dick Todd, well-known Victor recording artist. Del King speaking. Good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company. new. It's amazing. It's Prell. P-R-E-L-L. Procter & Gamble's new radiant cream shampoo in the handy tube. Prell brings you the life of Riley. Prell, the shampoo that removes unsightly dandruff in as little as three minutes, leaves hair more radiantly clean, radiantly lovely, presents the Life of Riley, with William Bendix as Riley. <laughs> the family
family we are about to join, that of Chester A. Riley, is a typical American household consisting of two parents and two children. Junior is a normal 13-year-old boy. Babs is a normal teenage girl. Peg Riley is a normal housewife. And Riley himself is, uh, well, he's the father. <laughs> Being a typical family, though, the Rileys occasionally have their minor disagreements. Daddy, you've simply got to do something about Junior. Well, what's the matter with Junior? Babs is right, Riley. Lately, Junior's been impossible. Do you know what he had the nerve to do? He took my diary out of my drawer and read it. Okay, so he read your diary. And this morning, he was shooting off his BB gun in the house. And he used my Uncle Baxter's picture for a target. He shot a hole right through his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's so funny? That bullet's the first thing that's gotten through your uncle's head in years. <laughs> We're talking about Junior. Really, Daddy, you just have to do something with him. What do you want me to do, give him away? I've had him 13 years. i got too much money invested in him. <laughs> oh, but he gets worse every day. He, he's the wild... Boys will be boys, Peg. they got a lot of energy. Why, why, when I was a kid, I was always getting into scrapes. <laughs> I remember once I filled my water pistol with tomato ketchup and squirted it all over a nice clean bed sheet hanging on the line. <laughs> Did my mother tear her hair? No. She took the bed sheet and used it as a tablecloth. It looked natural. And our tablecloth had holes in it, so we used it as a bed sheet, and that looked natural. <laughs> Believe me, boys would be boys. Unless they're girls. <laughs> But, Daddy, you have no idea what Junior's like. Well, hello, Pop. Hello, Pop. Junior. I'm going over to Egbert. You're play... staying right here, Junior. What's the matter? Your father wants to have a talk with you. Well, what about? What did I do? You all try to be so innocent. You know very well what you did. Reading my personal diary. Now, Bad, she's only a kid. And ruining my uncle's picture. Peg, let the kid live. And breaking your father's new pipe. What? <laughs> let me ask that kid. He's a fiend. <laughs> Morning, Joe. Morning, Riley. Better hurry up and punch that clock. You don't want to get the boot, do you? Ah, oh, don't worry about me, Joe. Old man Stevenson wouldn't fire me. Why, I'm the backbone of this plant. Stevenson would never give the boot to his own backbone. <laughs> hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work I go. I've been late before. If the boss gets sore, I'll tell him where to go. Hi-ho, hi-ho. Did you see a bar, mister? Oh, mm, no, no, Sonny. No. You did so! No, kid, I didn't see no ball. Yes, you did. You snitched it. Now, wait a minute, kid. I didn't touch your ball. You're a big, fat ball stealer. Why, are you fresh looking... Who are you calling fat? Oh, you? there you are, Cecil. I've been looking all over for you. Oh, hello, boss. Oh, Riley. I see you've made my nephew's acquaintance. Oh, your nephew, Mr. Stevenson. <laughs> what a darling child. <laughs> I was just going to pat him on the head. You big fat ball stealer! I really must reduce. <laughs> Cecil, that's no way to talk to Mr. Riley. I don't know what to do with the kid. Make him a foreman. <laughs> Come back to my office and wait for me there, Cecil. Oh, all right. And don't bite my secretary again. Interesting type of child, boss. My brother's kid. He can't handle him either. Uh, Takes him to a psychologist twice a week. Oh, to get him psychoalkalized, huh? <laughs> That's a lot of bunk, you know. Well, it's, it's good in most cases, but so far it's failed here. Say, say, you have a boy, haven't you, Riley? Oh, yeah, sure. Junior, he's 13. Does he give you any trouble? Junior? Never. Perfect little gentleman. That's because I know how to handle boys. He can't do a thing with Cecil. Yeah. Can't get him interested in anything. Buy him toys, he breaks them. Buy him books, he burns them. Does your boy read books? Oh, yeah, you bet. Lately, he's been reading one my daughter wrote. I mean... <laughs> Oh, he, he's a great little reader. He's... I'm going to have that kid in my hands all day. My sister-in-law talked me into taking him down to the plant. I'm afraid to let him out of my sight for a second. He's liable to stick his head in a dynamo. Oh, that would be awful. So hard to get new dynamos these days. <laughs> Say, Riley, I've got an important all-day conference with the executives of the Bank of America, and I wonder if you'd do me a big favor. You want me to go to the conference for you? Sure. No, 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 not that. Uh, I'd like you to... Oh, I hate to ask you. Oh, but... go ahead, Ed. Well, I don't like to impose well, on you. Go on, boss. Well, That's I'd really be... not fair. I'd be you. happy to. What is it, boss? Any... Would you take the day off and just look after Cecil? <laughs> Could we start this whole conversation over again? <laughs> But 
Well, I don't want to play with him, Pop. He's just a kid. How can you say that, Junior? Just look at Cecil. He's a very sweet little boy. No, I'm not. My psychologist says I'm antisocial. <laughs> now, 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 Cecil, be a good boy and play with Junior. I'm a schizophrenic, too. Well, I don't want to play with him, Pop. Junior, come over here a minute. Now, listen, Junior, you've got to play with Cecil. I don't want no trouble with my boss. Pop. Listen, Junior. I ain't going to use physical force on you because you're getting pretty big. But you're going to do what I say. And this ain't your mother talking or Babs. You're getting this straight from the horse's mouth. <laughs> okay, I'll play with him. Good. Now, Cecil, what do you and Junior want to do? You want to play some nice games? How about a swell game of hide-and-seek, huh? Eh? No. Well, how about a game of tag? No. How about follow the leader? Through some nice dark swamp. Hey, I got a football. You want to play football? Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll play too, huh? No, what? you two guys would jump on me. This kid's a mind reader. <laughs> now look, Cecil. There must be something you want to do. Can you draw? You want to draw some pictures, huh? I can't draw good. Well, Junior will teach you. He can draw great. How about it, Cecil? How we? All right, I'll humor you. <laughs> Junior, get your crayons and draw some pictures for Cecil, huh? I don't want to. Junior, I'm losing my patience. I'm entitled to respect. If you don't do like I say when the circus comes to town, I ain't taking you. You'll have to sneak under that tent without me. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll draw him pictures. Uh, better. I'll go on up in the attic where you won't be in anybody's way. Why can't we draw in the living room? Because the couch is in the living room, and for the next two hours, I'm going to be on that couch. I just spent 20 minutes with Cecil, and I'm anti-sociable. <laughs> well, Cecil, how are you and Junior been... Hey, where's Junior? Wouldn't you like to know? Cecil, where's Junior? What did you do with Junior? I cut off his head and burned him up in the incinerator. <laughs> Cecil, you're a very naughty boy. That incinerator is only for rubbish. You, you... <laughs> the, the incinerator? Oh, my poor Junior! What's the matter? Oh, Junior, thank heaven you're safe. Oh, I fooled you! I fooled you! Why, you... You... Okay, Cecil, darling. Time to go home now. Come along. I want the picture! Give me the picture! What picture? Of the cow! Give me it! Give me it! Oh, here, you can have it, Cecil. Well, Junior, I'm glad to see you drew lots of pictures, like I said. Didn't you? Well, I, I didn't actually... You were a good boy and you obeyed me, so I'm raising your allowance to 40 cents. Why, thanks, Pa. Well, come on, Cecil. Your uncle set his car for you. The chauffeur's waiting outside. I hate him. Cecil, wait a minute. Look, uh, your uncle's going to ask you how you liked it here, so you tell him you had a swell time and I treated you swell and... You think Riley is a swell guy and that I ought to get a raise. You understand? Hmm? Yeah, I understand. Are you sure now? Now, what are you going to tell him? I'm going to tell him you're a big, fat monster and you didn't give me anything to eat and you beat me and I'll tell him to fire you. <laughs> what a revolting development this is. <laughs> Uh, good morning, Mr. Stevenson. You wanted to see me? Yes, I did, Riley. It's about Cecil. It ain't true what he said. I didn't beat him. Take I... it easy, Riley. I know you didn't. I'm used to Cecil's stories by now. Oh, that's a relief. Oh, that kid sure is a problem. Did he say I was a big, fat monster? Yes. Well, but... that's an awful thing to say. Well, don't it? worry about it. He says I'm a big, fat monster, too. Yeah, well, he knows you better than he... I mean... <laughs> You're his uncle. I'm a stranger. He... Well, I don't think Cecil will give us much trouble from now on. The psychologist found out what's wrong with him. He ain't human? <laughs> well, it's not as bad as all that. You see, they found out that Cecil's got the mind of a nine-year-old, but physically he's only seven. And as a result, there are emotional conflicts. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I get it. His brain is too big for his britches, huh? <laughs> They found out something else, too. It seems that Cecil's always been dominated by women. His mother, his sisters, his aunts. A woman has always told him what to do and what to say and what to eat. <laughs> Seven years old and already he's living the life of a married man. 
No wonder he makes trouble. There, she's frustrated, so he's very aggressive. Well, that's very interesting. How did this psychologist figure this out? <laughs> In a way, you were responsible. Me? Yeah. You know that drawing he brought home from your place? Your... Oh, you, you mean of that crazy-looking cow? <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Well, that's how the psychologist found out what's wrong. He analyzed this drawing. You know, they have special techniques. You mean that he looked at that drawing and he could tell that the kid that did it has a nine-year-old mind and gets kicked around by women? More or less. It's all a little beyond me, but this psychologist is tops in his field. Oh, 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 the poor kid. Well, what's the cure? There must be a cure. But you don't get just... so upset, Riley. You'd think it was your own kid. Oh. Yeah, there's a cure, all right. All we've got to do with Cecil is to let him express his personality, not let those women dominate it. And that'll fix it. Oh, yeah. She'll be a normal kid in no time at all. Well, thanks for all you did, Riley. Oh, don't mention it, boss. Say, this whole thing taught me a lot. Well, goodbye, boss. Goodbye, Riley. Oh, my poor junior. He's 13 and he's only got the mind of a nine-year-old. <laughs> no wonder he's been so bad. He don't like bears and pegs to dominate. He's frustrated. <laughs> But I'll cure him if it's the last thing I do. Before I'm through, that boy's going to have a mind like I got. <laughs> oh, the poor kid. <laughs> well, we'll bring you the second act of The Life of Riley in a moment. It's talked about wherever you go. It's Prell, Prell, Prell. Procter & Gamble's Radiant Cream Shampoo in the handy tube. Millions of attractive women say... My very first Prell shampoo made an amazing difference in my hair. Snapped it so beautifully radiant, so easy to comb and manage. And men, too, agree. Prell shampoo's a wonder for removing unsightly dandruff. And that man-sized Prell lather does a thorough job. Leaves a man's hair and scalp feeling clean and fresh. Yes, that's what you hear everywhere you go. First, because Prell leaves hair more radiant than any soap shampoo. Leaves no soap film to cloud its natural sheen. Second, because Prell removes unsightly dandruff in as little as three minutes. Doctor's examinations proved it. And Prell's economical, too. It goes farther than any known shampoo, cream, or liquid because it's more concentrated. Prove it for yourself. Tomorrow, ask for Prell shampoo. P-R-E-L-L Prell shampoo. By Prell. <laughs> And now back to the life of Riley with William Bendix as Riley. Is that you, Riley? Now, hello, Peg. Hi, Daddy. Peg, w where's Junior? In the bag. He's hanging up my laundry. He's been a perfect angel ever since you scolded him. He does everything I tell him to. He does? For baths, too? Oh, yes, he's been a darling. He did errands for me. This afternoon, he went all the way to the library for me. Twice. So what's the matter, Riley? Peg, how old is Junior? You know how old he is. Thirteen. Well, are you sure? Well, of course. He was born in 1935. Yeah, I know. But are we positive that he's 13? Well, it's simple arithmetic. It's 1948. He was born in 35, and 35 from 48 is how much? Nine? <laughs> of course not, Daddy. It's 13. Well, that's what I thought. i got to have a talk with that boy right away. Now, leave him alone, Riley. You have one talk with him, and everything's fine. Now, don't spoil it. Peg, you just don't understand boys like Junior. You... Oh, I don't, eh? I just happened to be his mother for 13 years. Well, I happened to be his father for nine, so we're even. <laughs> if I want to talk to him, I'll talk to him. My head's made up. <laughs> What'd you want to talk to me about, Pop? Junior, listen, I just spoke to your mother and sister. Well, I was obeying them honest, Pop. I obeyed them. I know. And it's got to stop. What? I said it's got to stop. You're old enough to understand simple English. After all, you're nine going on ten. <laughs> huh? Uh, Pop, instead of waiting till the summer, why don't you take your vacation now? This is no time to talk about vacations. Now, listen carefully. You've got to stop being dominated by women. But you said to obey them. Never mind what I said. Just do what I say. <laughs> now, listen. From now on, any woman tells you to do something and you don't want to do it, don't you do it. Every woman? Yes, everyone. Your mother, Babs, your girlfriend. But why, Pop? Because they're ruining your life, son. They are? Yeah, so you've got to fight them. Don't let them shove you around. You do what you want. Gee, Pop, I just don't get it. Never mind. You can trust me. Oh, believe me, if there were only men in this world, you children would have a much easier time of it. <laughs> Hi, 
wake up and I'm home. How's my sweet little wife this evening? Eh? Chester Riley, I want to talk to you. <laughs> my sweet little wife sounds a little sour. <laughs> Never mind the comedy. What did you say to Junior yesterday? Yesterday? Well, I... nothing special, just a little father and son talk. We... I told you to leave him alone. Well, what's he done now? What hasn't he done? He's worse than ever. He won't do a thing, I tell him. And he's downright rude. And he's been fighting with Babs constantly. Why, he even had a fight with his girlfriend, Marilyn. She was here this afternoon, and he sent her home in tears. Oh, I don't know what's the matter with that boy. He's, he's acting like a ten-year-old. A ten-year-old? Well, great, he's already a year smarter. <laughs> what? Now, Riley, we've never spanked either of the children. But if Junior now, doesn't... wait a minute, Peg. Did you ever stop to think that this might not be Junior's fault? Well, then whose fault is it? Yours. What? Why, that's... Of all... Now, 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 take it easy. Calm down. Your face is purple. It clashes with the green wallpaper. You have the nerve to tell me it's my fault? Well, it's kind of complicated. You see, you're Junior's mother, but unfortunately, you're also a woman. Eh? Oh, I see. <laughs> And just when did you discover this? Today. <laughs> you see, you're, you're dominating the kid. Of course, you don't mean to. You're unconscious half the time. <laughs> I mean, I mean of dominating him. You, do I make myself clear? Riley, okay. instead of waiting until the summer, why don't you take your vacation now? <laughs> Never mind the vacation. I'm trying to explain something. You see... Hello, hey, Pa. Oh, hello, well, Tony. it's about time you're home. Where have you been all this time? Oh, nowhere. What's that letter you got there? Oh, it's for Pa. It's from my teacher. From your teacher. You see, Riley, I told you. Now he's making trouble in school. Now, take it easy, Peg. Let's see what the teacher has to say. <clears throat> Dear Mr. Riley, I am gravely concerned over Junior's behavior. He has always been a model pupil, but today I was shocked by his actions. He has become incur... Incur... Peg, what's this word here? Incorrigible old junior. Is that bad? It's very bad. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> what do you mean it's good? Well, let's read the rest. He is rude and disobedient to such a degree that I thought it best to arrange an interview with Dr. Bergman, the school psychologist. A psychologist? What for? So the teacher noticed it, too. Noticed what? Riley, what are you tapping your forehead for like that? Well, uh, Junior, would you leave us alone for a minute, please? Okay, but remember, Pop, you said you'd back me up if I did what you told me. Yeah, Junior. Riley, did you tell Junior to disobey? Well, I had to on account of a drawing. What drawing? Of the cow, the one Junior drew for Cecil. Oh, will you please make sense? I'm trying to tell you, the reason he's so forward is because he's backward. Uh, in his mind. Oh, that's ridiculous. But he's been getting A's all his life. How can he suddenly... Oh, look, we'll straighten the whole thing out when we see the psychologist. I heard about this, Dr. Bergman. He's one of the best experts on backward minds. We'll take Junior to see him. All right. And while we're there, we'll let him take a look at you, too. <laughs> Oh, my head. I'm, I'm all mixed up. I've got to get straightened out. Thanks. It's a good thing I dropped in. <laughs> Who's that? It is I, Digby O'Dell, the friendly undertaker. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm glad you're here, Digger. I feel terrible. I... Mm, you're not looking well. Much worse than most of the people I've seen lately. <laughs> well, maybe I need to go away for a long rest You know, some nice spot in the country Where there's grass and flowers And nothing but peace and quiet I know just the spot <laughs> Would you like me to drive you there? No, no I, I gotta stay in town and see a psychologist About my junior Poor kid, he's not getting much fun out of life Ah, uh, the youth of today seems so restless Things were different when we were boys. We had gay sports. Tell me what's wrong with the dear lad. Well, I hate to say it, but the kid was born 13 years ago, but he's only nine. I mean, in his mind. Your junior? Yeah. Pibble. Pibble, touch and pibble. Where did you get such a preposterous notion? Well, I 
Got it sort of second hand from a psychologist. <laughs> psychologist. When I opened my first place of business, things were very quiet. I became neurotic. A psychologist told me, Odell, you will be a failure as an undertaker unless you concentrate on your work. Throw yourself into it. If I had, where would I be today? I don't know. This other psychologist is a big shot. Can, can a big doctor like that make a mistake? I've known many a doctor to make a mistake, but I've covered up. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm seeing another psychologist in a few minutes. It can't do any harm. But don't worry about it. Take it from me. Your boy is all right. He's bright, alert, and alive. And I ought to know who's alive. <laughs> well, cheerio. I'd better be shoveling off. <laughs> Now, listen, Peg, I'll do all the talking with the psychologist. Oh, uh, you, you... right, but I hope you make sense. Well, don't worry. And, Junior, don't you worry either. Okay, Pop. Yeah. Everything will be okay. You're alive, Digger Odell says so. <laughs> oh, here's the doctor. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I'm Dr. Berkman. Oh, uh, I'm Mr. Riley, and this is my boy, Junior. How do you do? Well, let's all sit down and have a little chat, and we'll see if we can't find out. Oh, I, I know what the trouble is. You see, Junior here, well, his mind is, uh, uh, B-A-K-W-A-R-D. I'm not back. Junior, the doctor knows best. Oh, Dr. Bergman, Junior's perfectly all right. My... Yes, yes, go on, Mr. Riley. Uh, what gave you the idea that Junior was backward? Well, that's what the other psychologist said. Oh, oh, I see. You, you, you took him to see what? No, no, Junior made this drawing, see? Only he gave it to this kid, Cecil, and his psychologist analyzed it, see? Just a moment. Are you, are you talking about Cecil Stevenson? Well, yeah. How did you know? <laughs> Mr. Riley thinks I want to show you something. Uh, <laughs> is, is, is this the drawing? Well, hey, where did you get that? Uh, I'm Cecil's psychologist. Oh, you're the one. You analyzed it. Yes, I thought it was Cecil's work. No, no, it was Junior's. Oh, uh, no, Pop, I didn't draw it. You, you didn't, but I thought, well, why didn't you tell me this? Well, why didn't you ask me? Well, I thought, I, I, I didn't know. I, I, I didn't think that if you, when it, if you, not this kid's confusing me. <laughs> Believe me, it isn't hard. Now, 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 let us all be serious. Did Cecil draw this or did he not? Uh, no, he didn't. We found it in our attic. What? Let me see that drawing. Here you are. Oh, oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> well, what's the joke, Peg? Oh, Riley, you drew this a long time ago. I did. <laughs> well, what do you know about <laughs> Oh. <laughs> well, 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 what's the matter? Oh, Doc, you've got to help me. Oh, this is terrible. Well, what's wrong? Well, you said whoever drew this has a nine-year-old mind. Well? Well, when I drew this, I was 37. <laughs> I'm a problem, child. <laughs> We'll be back in just a moment. Prell tells itself to all the family. Yes, Prell, Procter & Gamble's Radiant Cream Shampoo in the handy tube. Listen to what Mrs. Norman H. Roby of Chattanooga, Tennessee, has to say about Prell. I find that Prell tube a convenience in so many ways, especially when shampooing my small son's hair. And we all love that rich lather, that clean fragrance, and the shining results of Prell. Yes, your whole family will love Prell, too, once you try it and see how radiant Prell leaves hair, how quickly it removes embarrassing dandruff. Ask for it at your favorite shampoo counter. Try Prell. <laughs> P-R-E-L-L Prell Shampoo Leaves hair radiant, gleaming bright Not a bit of dandruff is in sight Comes in a tube, handy, too P-R-E-L-L Prell Shampoo Oh, Riley, will you stop worrying? 
You really haven't got the mind of a nine-year-old. Well, thanks, Peg, but the drawing... But you heard what the psychologist said. In your case, it doesn't prove anything. There are other factors to consider. Oh, and the drawing don't prove nothing. Of course not. <laughs> sure. What am I worrying about? After all, it's ridiculous to think that a woman could dominate me. Why, the woman don't exist that can tell me what to do. Riley, when you finish washing the dishes, put out the garbage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Psychology. What a laugh. A woman trying to give me orders? <laughs> the more I think of it, the more I have to laugh. Actually, I dominate women. Now, where's that garbage? It must be... <laughs> Dr. Gamble invites you to join us again next week to hear The Life of Riley with William Bendix as Riley. The script is by Alan Lipscott and Reuben Schiff and Dick Powell. Mrs. Riley is Paula Winslow. Digger O'Dell is John Brown. The Life of Riley is produced by Irving Brecker. And remember, for more radiant hair, free of unsightly dandruff, get the shampoo in the tube. P-R-E-L-L. Prell Shampoo. <laughs> Another run. My favorite nylons, too. How do some girls make their stockings last so long? Wise girls know they're safe in snow. Yes, safe in... <laughs> Wonderful ivory snow. Lovely nylons can stay lovely longer with ivory snow care. Its ivory mildness helps safeguard stocking glamour, reduces stocking runs. And ivory snow is speedy, too. Gives instant suds even in cool water. It's the only soap, both ivory mild and granulated. There's no other soap like it. Ivory Snow Care is wonderful for all nice washables. Your hands will tell you why. Wash dishes with ivory snow as millions do. See how it pampers your hands. Then you'll know lovely washables can stay lovely longer with... Wonderful Ivory Snow. This is Ken Niles reminding you to listen again next Friday when Procter & Gamble again brings you a full hour of entertainment. First, Red Skelton, and then, The Life of Riley. Goodbye. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.